Right, so see so you guys know, Mr. Meenan is in charge of the actual presentation, so I can't move this. He's in charge of the I'm presentation, steering. pushing it through. So um, yep. so basically, when it goes wrong, you know who's a blame. Yeah, so, uh, yeah we've, all, we've all got backups. but We're live, dude. You're not supposed to throw me under the bus live. <laughs> oh. So um, you're in charge, mate. I'll start swearing in a minute. Okay, all right. Um, how do we know ev how everyone's in? Sorry, I, I know I know Zoom a bit, but... We don't know if everyone's in. It's a case of when we think we've got a good enough number. And right now we have got over 100 in. Your Joe. Okay, right. Let's get started. Okay, yeah. great. Um, sorry for us waffling on and John abusing me as he does live on this <sighs> webinar. Okay, everybody. What we thought we were going to do um, during the summer season was try and help and assist in sharpening the old pencils in our brains um, for uh, EICR coding. Um, because every time you go on social media, um, lots and lots of people like to have a row over it. It's a great protagonist for just fighting and arguing and just kicking off and people then just hating upon each other forever, which is just a total waste of energy. So what we thought we'd do is we'd just throw ourselves under the bus, have this kind of live debate with some, with some photos and pictures. But also what I want to do is I want to maybe try and give you some additions into your thought process toolbox that an inspector should have. Um, so what we're going to do is we're just going to go basically straight, if, if my computer now works, yeah, that is, we'll go into it. So little trip back in time for those who are a little bit um, old, older than um, the youngsters uh, in our industry at the moment. Anyone remembers this brown book, um, which was one of my personal favorites. Um, that was uh, the 16th edition, Amendment 2. That was the last time that those codes appeared in 7671. C1, C2, C3, C4. And if we go through those codes, a C1 required urgent attention. Lots of debate on how urgent things could be. And the non-technical layman would go, well, it's urgent to you. It's not maybe urgent to me. So it kind of left quite a lot it of is, the ICRs. It's definitely rel it's relative, isn't it? To the... Well, yes, it's, it is. And the trouble is, is, years ago, we called it periodics. Um, but the trouble is, and this is again my, this is where I kind of pull people as well. The act itself is a periodic inspection of the installation. The output of the periodic inspection is the electrical installation condition report. The codes form part of the condition report. Whilst undertaking that, you will be using your skills, your knowledge, uh, and everything you have in your arsenal to appropriately code the installation. Photos are a great debate tool but they're not the be all and end all of it. And which what we'll try and do is change mm. up a bit on some of that today, which may that's, be. That's a very important thing to say, actually, because a photo is obviously just, you know, it's just a visual representation of what's in front of you, but it doesn't explain the scenario, the site, the demand, the utilization. There's so much more that you need to obviously understand when you see an image, you've got to know so much more about what's just on the image. It's like with anything you see on the news, you can see an image which easily can be doctored and presented in a different way. Um, and that's very much the same with coding. And, and it's for us, the sharing of photos on our Instagram, for instance, is a great way of sharpening the pencil, getting the debate, looking for more information, having a desire to understand what else am I missing? What things sit outside the boundaries of that picture, the use of the installation, the application of it, the age, all these sorts of things. So C1 used to have a lot of argument. C2 mm -hmm. required improvement. So everyone used to go, well, what's the difference between a C1 and a C2? They both need doing not really defined very well and didn't get much remedial work from that as a contractor. And this is what I learned on C3 required further investigation uh, and C4. This was a really controversial one. Does not comply with BS7671 amended to whatever the addition was, but it didn't imply the installation was unsafe. So yeah. it caused, I mean, Dave, you remember this, this one, this one code created pages and pages and pages oh. of reports. Yeah. And the problem would be the client would then go, but is it unsafe? They go, no, 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 no. You know, you know, legacy says the regulations aren't less safe now that they've changed. So you get pages and pages and pages of information, which the client would then not actually want much knowledge of or to use what to use. Uh, and that's, you know, that's pretty much why they got flushed out. I, I think, I remember, you know, because when they changed from the periodic inspection, that was more like a, a, you know, a timed check whilst changing it to condition reporting is the wording is supposed to basically tell the client that actually this is more important than you probably think it is, you know, Indeed. and they should Indeed. take action on it. Um, I, I spent a long time uh, arguing. Uh, I used to see so many that were C2s and C4s. 
And, and, and what mm. this demonstrated was a, uh, to me, when I would receive the reports or even have guys that was working with me and I was the NICQS at the time, which was a wonderful period of my career because uh, I was inspected uh, back in those days. I wasn't assessed and there was m certainly a difference between an inspection and assessment, which I enjoyed mm, because I had... That's a long discussion that one, isn't it? Well, you could, we could do a podcast yeah. just on that alone. Yeah. Um, but it, it was trying to get the people to understand the use of the book, the, the just biting it off bit by bit by bit. This is why mm. we say, if you want to learn the wine rigs, read chapter 13, Fundamental Principles, and then just learn it in anger when you're going along throughout the, the journey of, I need to understand more, I'm having a debate with someone. So that was the old codes, cause chaos. So for the, for the younger people in the industry, that's just a little bit of history there, really. Um, moving and it caused chaos. There's my little gift man again, as always, who just likes like confused. And I've seen that look on many faces. So we let's fast forward to where we are now. We're on Amendment One. Danger present. C1. Risk of injury. Immediate remedial action required. I can see it. I can touch it. It will kill me now. C2. Potentially dangerous. Urgent remedial action required. That to me is one failure of something. I have a big problem which becomes C1. So I'm one step away from being a C1. C3, improvement recommended. FI, which was a, a new code, further investigation. Now, I'm going to be really controversial here and I'm not going to read the comments because uh, I'll probably go as FI, I, I, I only ever want to see FI on a report where I'm time limited. This is my professional opinion and that is all down to the um, extent and limitations of the inspection. Hmm. So you'd say... So you'd say an FI would always be a result of an operational limitation, like yeah. in time. Yeah, and, and, it, and it, can be, it can be something as simple. I mean, on the domestic front, you may find that you spend two and a half hours on one lighting circuit. Mm. So you have no choice to, but to FI the installation. It's, it's purely time-centric. I would rather spend the time qualitatively pulling apart lighting circuit, making sure it's fault-free or, or I, I'm not giving rise to danger for that installation um, and tell the customer that as you're going along. So for me, FI is more of an extension of time. Um, mm -hmm. I know others will look at it differently. I mean, John, what do you think FI, you're still doing periodics every other day? Yeah, I mean, FI, say, it's not something you're going to use that often, certainly on domestic stuff. Um, and say, like you said, unless it's a time thing, because most domestic stuff is usually pretty evident as to what the problem is if there is one. Um, so it's, it's not something that's going to come up that often. But there are situations where that can come up. So if you can't, say, get at something particularly, or there's some kind of fault that uh, is going to take you the next 10 hours to locate or something, then... I guess that's uh, that's probably the biggest problem is it does, you say, 10 hours. I mean, but there's someone saying in chat here, you know, would you use FI if you had a open circuit, open ring final circuit? And if you're pressured for time because you're given these, you know, maybe you've got a work process where you have to do X amount per day and you're at the board and you've got open circuit... If you're then going to go immediately FI that without having the freedom to then put an extra, it could be found in 20 minutes, it might take you an hour and a half. You know, that's the problem. You don't know. And it all depends on your, you know, your, you know, your fault finding skills and maybe your, your immediate observational skills. Um, but a lot of people might just go, oh, no, that's a fault, but it needs to be found later, FI. Um, and, and, and it can and easily be used incorrectly there. Just on the, uh, just, I've had a quick look at the comments. Um, rightly so, Sean as per FI could be uh, a further investigation required by the DNO, which is a third party, mm -hmm. which again, you would need to discuss with the client. Now, there is a big bugbear about uh, a you know, immediate danger notifications where the responsibility for notifying the DNO appears to be getting advised as by the person ordering the works. But the person ordering the works, and again, guys jump on my head, they're not competent mm -hmm. to understand what to tell the DNO. This is where no. that, to me, a duty of care. So the fact that industry, and I'm going to say this, industry bodies are saying it's the responsibility of the person ordering the works. Only if you give them extreme clear guidance and adequate communication of what to do and how to do it. But by the time you've done that, you're better off doing it yourself. And they, um, the only other use, again, of FI would be um, Regulation 653.2, which is covered under the extent and limitations. If the client says, I only want you to test the sockets and the earthing, mm -hmm. That's all you're testing. But again, there's that box where you would have the limitations agreed by the client yes. and the client would sign that. Yeah, and so you could that covers. FI or limit. Yeah. yeah. I think the point with all of these is that 
whatever code you're going to put down, it's not just going to be, oh, here's a code, that's the end of it. You're going to have to put it C whatever or FI because, and then an explanation as to what actually the problem is and what further actions may or may not be needed. Because uh, if you just stick down a code, it's it's pretty meaningless just on its own. So yeah, they all need context and additional information. You've just confused the mad scientist again who doesn't understand John. He's appeared on the screen. <laughs> You've just confused him. He's just like, what is John Ward saying? I don't understand. EICRs, what's that? Right, let's move on. And I want to just very quickly brief you on this document. Now, anyone who knows who E5R, that's our logo. We, we promote and we use the Statement of Ethical Principles, which is published by the Engineering Council of the UK. Now, what's that got to do with EICR? Bear with me. In the document, it says engineering professionals are professional engineers, technicians, tradespeople, you guys and girls, students, apprentices, trainees, anyone who's engaged in the activity of engineering, um, engineering has such a wide breadth and depth of meaning nowadays. Non-engineers managing, teaching professionals should all be made aware. And, and all it does is it gives some great fundamental guidance towards honesty, integrity, look, respect for life, law, the environment and public good, accuracy and rigor, leadership and communication. There are videos and documents you can download. We'll put them on the YouTube video down there. So this is what everyone fears. Every single coding argument there is is you'll see people at uh, live events, they'll go, oh, well, if I don't do this bonding, will I go to prison? Will I get prosecuted? How many prosecutions has there been? If I pull the DNO fuse, will I get prosecuted? There actually was one, and they were prosecuted under the one I know of, and that was Health and Safety Work Act Section 3. Uh, and that's because um, I have put a note somewhere on social media, I'll dig it out again, uh, EDF Energy, who were the DNO at the time, um, the DNO equipment is theirs. So under Health and Safety uh, at Work Act, they only authorise their employees to work on it. However, we now have some DNOs, if you're an NIC contractor, you can pull the equipment. Well, if you haven't had training on the equipment, how can you work on it safely? And, and that's something we're probably going to cover, Dave, in a future webinar, yeah. I think, um, mm -hmm. because I think we, we, that, may, that issue may not go to bed for some many, many years to come. Um, I have been trained personally um, by the DNOs to work on equipment. I was very fortunate to pull fuses, reinstate. I've seen the hazards of old uh, fuse neutrals, coffin fuses, working on the pilk, um, which is the paper insulated lead stuff. Probably um, it's important to just mention at this point that there are obviously meter installers who have some authorization to remove, who yes. are trained. We're not recognizing that training necessarily here, uh, I would say. No, no, no. It's 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 basically minimal training to give authority to work on said yeah. equipment without understanding the principles of electricity. I know because I've done the course. Mm. I went to do the metering course, and I was the only qualified electrician in the room, which quite scared me. Now, a lot of sparks I've seen online have said, "Oh well, a judge will argue whether it's a C one." No, they won't. If you think for any moment in time a judge will care whether it's a C one, C two, C three, FI. No, they won't because there's lots and lots of laws and legislation. Now, one of, the, one of the big issues I see a lot of is understanding definitions because years ago, they removed the word competent, didn't they, from the um, good workmanship and materials regulation. And they talked about skilled and instructed. So in 7671 currently, page 31, part two, an instructed person is adequately supervised or supervised by a skilled person mm. to ensure that person to perceive risks and avoids hazard, hazards, which electricity can create. So even a, a mate or an apprentice or a laborer has to either be supervised or have sufficient knowledge to perceive the risk. Yeah. And the key thing, the key wording there, especially something a judge is gonna obviously try to get evidence of is how adequacy was determined, yep. what levels of competency were required and what the, uh, you know, if the observation and the control fundamentally was adequate. And this is, I mean, something I do a lot of training in is, is in trying to develop roles, responsibilities, training and duty holder training for companies who run businesses, who run engineers to understand how the law works in this area. And, you know, authorizations, roles, responsibilities, if you employ the services of an engineer, they, they may have some level of competency, but they may want to authorize them in certain areas. Some of you guys may have gone to certain factories, certain clients where they'll authorize you to receive permits to carry isolation, but they may not authorize you to do live work. They may not authorize you to access their switch rooms. There are, you know, there are many different levels of authorization. And that's how they try to adequately 
advise and adequately supervise in a competent structure. The adequacy of this is, is probably the hardest part that they will pin down. It wouldn't be C1, C2, C3. It'll all be about this. Indeed. And if you look at the notes, again, this is in 7671, note two. Regulation 16 of the electricity at work regs requires person to be competent. One of the reasons they took the word competent out was because it clashed. And if you think to yourself, um, if you're not aware, the governing the hierarchy of legislation or laws above 7671, which is effectively guidance, is an ACOP, which is the guidance on electricity work regs, and then the legislation electricity work regs 1989. That defines competency to avoid danger. So anything underneath it will just be a, a, a number of methods or, 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 or tools to achieve that and define what level of competence you need. Now we, I know I hate this, I can't stand it. I think it's awful. I'd rather have the word competent in, to be honest with you, because this just allows a lesser trained individual. Interpretation um, can be so, so It's difficult. dangerous. It's and we all know dangerous. that. And this is why we're finding so much rubbish. Mm. Um, so HSR 25 is a really good document. Um, so instructed person, okay? We know what they are. They're someone who should have uh, adequate, um, uh, has to be adequately advised to perceive risk and avoid hazards. We go on to the next one. If this PowerPoint works, forgive me. Skilled person. Skilled person is someone who possesses as appropriate to the nature of the work. So if somebody says to me, Paul, please go and gland armoured in a petrol station, immediately I go, well, I can gland an armoured, but I, I don't understand fully the nature of what I'm doing if it's around petrol pumps. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. I need to then have adequate education, training, practical skills, and I need to be able to perceive risk. Okay, now risk is a key word. Okay, because everybody argues and, and falls out over coding, 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 because it's in the regs. What we're going to try and do here is try and think of a bigger picture. Again, give you more tools to think outside the box. Again, it references note two. So the word competent does actually appear in the wine regs. It appears, I think it's about 12 six, times. Yeah. But these yeah. are the relevant regulations that actually have the word competent. I've highlighted it. So if you're watching this on YouTube, you can sit and just read. And what the word competent is, is very specifically worded is when people are doing initial, initial verification or electrical inspection and testing work. You must be competent. The weirdest reg is 641.6, which is the second one. Verification be made by one or more skilled persons competent in such work. That to me is, well, you have the skills re uh, relevant to identify risk, but you're also very proficient and the application of understanding the risk in inspection and testing. And again, it, is, it goes, it goes, it goes uh, full circle because the legislation looks for under competency relative to the nature of the work. Yeah. And so if you were to say, yes, I can carry out periodic inspections, you may have the understanding of, you know, wiring regulations, uh, installation practices, but you also need to understand the nature of where you are, where you're working, because as I've said, you know, utilization, demand, even things like, you know, things having to be intrinsically safe may come into the inspection requirements and your competence. Um, so it's, this is why, again, ad adequacy of instruction, adequacy of authorization is what's needed mm -hmm. for competence and, that's and in a lot of cases, lacking. Dave, me and you both know people aren't authorised. There yeah. isn't that level of authorisation. It's only when you go into factories, plant, commercial, industrial, where there's more health and safety at work legislation um, that's prevalent and watched. Um, and we have all the closed call systems and you a come lot, into domestic. A lot of those are developed by experience. Yeah. By having experiences of the, the health and safety executive coming in to do an audit. They'll look at the control procedures and they'll look for where control is lost. When you lose control, that's where it's gone wrong. And that's what they look for. And, and this is one of, one of the things here is the, um, in the domestic scenario, it, it's, it's a lot more difficult because you have the instructed or skilled or competent person mm -hmm. in the consumer's house. And that person is not socially uh, able to perceive any form of electrical risks. So they will take the tradesman at their word, um, henceforth going with a registered contractor believing that that is a level of assurance with a guarantee and a warranty and all the rest of it. But we know from experience and just seeing around the industry that that isn't always the case. And I genuinely believe it's sometimes because work is undertaken by people who are not aware of what level of competence they hold. Um, and the industry isn't supporting them enough. So I want to give, I want to, I want to kind of change this up a bit. Yep. So just what I do regulation 16, 
no person shall be engaged in any work activity where technical knowledge or experience is necessary to prevent danger. So if you know someone who's doing the ICRs, it shouldn't be because if they don't have technical knowledge or experience, they shouldn't be doing it. Again, that's like an instructed person. Yeah. Um, or where appropriate injury, unless he possesses knowledge and experience or is under a degree of supervision, skilled and instructed, where he may be appropriate having regard to the nature of the work. Um, that to me gets clearer and clearer every time I read it. And also there's lots of good guidance behind it. That's the book, in case you're wondering. Now, a lot of terms, and I'm going to steal um, Richard's because I love him for it. Um, he uses the SCAPE term, suitably qualified knowledge, attitude, trained adequately and experienced. You can't have one of them. You have to have more. It means to be more cumulative of, uh, and this is one of the things I always say to people. Now, if I said to people on the chat, uh, what one word would you define as competence? And I've done this before at IET lectures. And I've gone around the room and I've asked for one word and every single person was right. But also every single person needed to realize that it was all of those terms. It was the perception greater than the one word that made competence. It was the cumulative uh, things, qualified knowledge, attitude, safe working attitudes. Yeah. Adequately trained, adequate experience, adequate knowledge of the systems you're working on. All very prevalent. So just moving forward, I want to introduce you to a new weapon and I shouldn't use that term, but it's um, a new book. Uh, it's actually not new. It's existed for years, but um, not many people knew it was there. Um, it's, it's published by the Engineering Council of the UK, and it's guidance on risk for the engineering profession. So it's actually prevalent for electricians. Now, if my it has within it six themes, six principles, which require you to apply professional responsible judgment, take a leadership role. Well, uh, any ICR inspector would apply professional responsible judgment. It asks you to adopt a systematic and holistic approach to risk identification, assessment and management. Well, an EICR inspector must identify risk and assess it and code it and manage it accordingly by the issuing of a document or possible danger notification. Can we just, must. Can I just accept one second? Um, Paul in chat is having, Paul in chat is struggling to see the slides. Can everyone else see? The, the slides okay because it might be that just Paul if it's just right yes yes right Paul just maybe restart Zoom buddy okay not you Paul uh, Paul in chat Paul all right not 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 not, not you Paul me and Paul because that that would be a real ball like if you did that yeah um, okay sorry crack on mate <laughs> he's having trouble seeing the slides apologies apologies okay um, I went with the black background so it doesn't hurt your eyes um, okay so um, this is the interesting one comply with legislation and codes to practice 7671 but be prepared to seek further improvements so this is why we have always said work from the regulations why because the engineering council of the uk which which talks directly to the privy council of government is telling us and recommending to us that we seek further improvements in complying with legislation and codes but, I've, I've never been satisfied with just yeah. working to the rigs but do you think this electrical industry does the other half of this does it actually you know, prepare to seek further improvement? Does it give us motivation? Does it give us the right support? No, it, well, let's be honest about it. I've been in this industry 20, nearly 25 years and this industry has never introduced this document to me, mm. which is why the minute I read it, I just went, that's relevant to a spark. That's relevant to a spark. Now, just to be clear, some parts of this document will be relevant to design engineers, you know, professionally registered chartered engineers, etc. But the content of this, you could print this out in a domestic home uh, and, and use this to inform your clients as to why you do what you do, why you're giving a professional service, because this is some of the governance and guidance that the engineering council mandate on you. Because I don't think any industry bodies publish this sort of stuff. Ensure good communication with others involved. Yeah, good communication will be your report and how clear it is. Ensure lasting systems for oversight and scrutiny. That's more business stuff, but contribute to public awareness of risk. The industry at the moment is screaming about EICRs because of one, the condition of certain installations and this new legislation, which is encouraging the drive by 38 pound, 80 pound. It's, it's yeah, it, it's, it's gesture rubbish. It was already yeah. a smoldering fire, but the legislation is just flaming it because oh, you know, just they, want, fuel they want to legislate something that was already broken as a system. And it's just going to drive. A, you know more of a broken system so just very quickly i'm going to skim through these you can mm -hmm. pause these if you're watching on youtube 
apply professional and responsible judgment taken engineers should demonstrate by example a commitment to safety reliability and ethical conduct hence the statement of ethical principles profession through professional management of risk from inception of any project that can include eicrs engineers at all levels should clearly demonstrate the standards which they expect risk to be managed sem 6 sem one in this case thus setting an example engineers should be prepared to challenge assumptions and proposals is kind of what we're trying to do with these ensure that safety receives appropriate consideration assess the balance of risk and reward that could be the cost of doing it against the level of time needed to uh, be required to complete the work strive for all those involved to be able to identify potential problems and opportunities ensure the engineer reporting to them has the opportunity to maintain competence in the area of risk how many electricians working for these periodic inspection companies are told how to assess risk how many of them are sat down and told can we do a risk assessment training course oh, today many of them have the rams done for them by the office who generic them. rams i do not agree with generic rams because it creates a culture of cut paste cut paste and then we don't know how to do it ourselves um, and then lead others in improving practice so what we're trying to do is by highlighting this to you guys and girls you can improve your own practices and use this so you can download this afterwards and absorb um, number two, adopt systematic and holistic approach to risk identification, assessment and management. This is EICRs to a T. Yeah, mm -hmm. the factors that give rise to risk are interdependent and cannot be examined in isolation. It is vital in managing risk to be aware of this interdependency rather than dealing with risks on one by one as they arise. Use approaches that deal with the whole systems. So look beyond technical considerations to address non-technical factors, human, organizational, cultural perceptions. What about use of installation? You know, is there a different risk factor in a nursery where small children are, uh, a hospital? You know, how do we how do we gauge and perceive that? Um, make risk assessments and management an integral part of engineering activity decision making. Using of RAMs dumbs that down. And I'm talking about generic RAMs. Uh, adopt a conservative decision making approach that is proportionate to risk. So I'm not going to go and do an ERC and say, oh, it's going to cost you 12 grand. The, the famous one, the plastic board. Or oh, C two, C one, got to get it changed straight away. Well, so really? many, so many, so many people are still looking at this as an industry to go in cheap and get remedials. Yes. So much of it is about creating remedials, and that again is against this ethic here. Aim to quantify the risks with as much precision as is relevant, sufficient, and can be supported by evidence. When I get any ICR document given to me, I I want evidence, so I throw it in the bin. I want, mm -hmm. I want justification. I want evidence. This is why I generally say good practices. If you're issuing a report now, use something like site pro and get it all photographed so you can code it as well and give it to the report. Uh, I wish to God, to be honest with you, half these reporting and softwares did that now. Yeah. Good. Good. I mean, key thing there is timestamping your photos, timestamping yes, your evidence. Timestamping is key. Yeah. Especially if you have to go back and your work is warranted in a domestic world. I've spoken to too many sparks in domestics where they will do a piece of work they go back 18 months later because they've done a five-year materials guarantee they turn up and somebody's done something but they can't prove it because they can't find the photos on the phone mm. so it's very much worthwhile um aim to quantify risk with as much precision as is relevant sufficient and can be supported be responsive to change in the operating environment look for connections patterns and relationships between risk and opportunity consider role of ergonomics bear in mind risk assessment should be used as an aid to professional judgment and not a substitute that's a controversial statement mm. yeah don't rely on a risk assessment use your professional judgment this is why we're talking about this be aware that developing an over elaborate procedure can lead to poor compliance and undermine wider safety culture so then number three if we just skip that top line regulations and codes are generic they can only deal with anticipated events and not predict predict every possible situation this is one of the things that we have all the time when people row over codes it's not worth rowing um, engineers should take a measured yet challenged approach to potential risks whether or not regulations apply engineers should act in accordance with codes of conduct if we know they exist and we wish to comply with them hopefully we would um, and know about and comply with law in countries where they're operating and where their products will be used recognize and understand the intent behind the standards and codes and understand when their limits are being approached comply with relevant legal requirements seek advice where it's reasonably practicable seek further improvements embedding a culture of continuous improvement be open-minded and avoid hiding behind regulations i love that i love that last great one. great that <laughs> you can see why we're talking about this now because nobody else in the industry will talk about this document no. um, moving on very quickly 
Good communication of others. I think that's evident. Strong, established, honest two-way communication, including with your clients and homeowners. Consultation and feedback process about risk. I do wish more people would ring mm. up the DNOs. When I used to ring up the DNO to report something, I did not give them an option. I threw my proverbial toys out the goddamn pram. Anything I needed to do to get them there, I got them there. Mm. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie about that. I genuinely did. I would literally tell them anything to get them immediately screeching down the road. Right, go and fix what you should be maintaining anyway. Mm -hmm. um, the same, for, it, same for clients as well. Your consultation with the clients, getting the clients to actually understand risk. Yeah, well, risk and just, benefit. They may have the attitude of, is it a pass or a fail? But, you know, uh, that's not really what you need to but do. The, 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 the more knowledge we have, the, the better we can express, as it says there, the balance of risk and benefit. Well, you don't have to change your board, but the benefit is this, enhanced mm -hmm. protection. Do you know what I mean? Which we now have the ability to sell to the consumer in the form of surge and arc fault detection. Um, encourage open reporting approach, spirit of questioning and learning from others. Hopefully we do that, although we do get shot and kicked for it many a time. Um, yeah, avoid definitely. a good news only or close culture. I don't think that's us. I think we, we, we will talk about all the parts of the culture. <laughs> um, Ensure the lasting systems for overnight oversight. Well, this is just about oversight and scrutiny. This is more about businesses and roles and responsibilities. I'm going to skip through that one. Mm -hmm. This is the important one. Contribute to public awareness of risk. The perception of risk among the public is influenced by a range of factors, including emotional ones. Engineers have an important role in raising awareness. We have to be prepared to engage in public debate because at the end of the day, how many people have rung up uh, Spark and gone, oh, my other Spark told me you're full of Da, 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 da. Do you know what I mean? You're, you've just conned me. You've done this. Uh, ensure discussion with the public uh, includes risk and its management and other factors. Ensure the concept of risk and reward is communicated. Recognise social, political and economic ex implications. Uh, and then explain quantitative aspects of risk and be honest and clear. Now, there is one other line in this, which I haven't put on the screen. And it says society's perception of risk may, different, may differ from the engineers. And therefore, engineers should strive for clarity when communicating about risk and communicate in terms understandable by non-specialists. This is, these are some of the areas where the conflict exists. I yeah. don't get it. I don't get it. Well, how many times has Ryan said about the forms that are filled with technical jargon, yeah. which doesn't communicate the risk to the actual recipient of that document? You know, fun. You can't, you can't write in, you know, you, obviously you can't write it bad. It's dangerous. You can't just go in too, too plain in English, but you've got to actually translate it. I'll time. tell a story. Very quick one. Um, I had a uh, phone call from a guy who was doing an EICR and he rung me up and he said, I've just finished the EICR. I went, great. And he went, it's all fucked. Excuse my language. And I went, okay, can you put it in like the terms of definition and codes? And he went, yeah, I'm up to 50. It's all fucked. And I literally had to go out and meet him. And the minute I saw him, the first words I said was, yeah, okay, that's all fucked. We need to change it. But um, interesting, when I was talking to him, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't string uh, um, the, he couldn't put the pieces together to make the jigsaw and put the case together to say, this is why you need to change that system or yeah. that consuming it or that distribution panel, which was, which was worrying, but it wasn't because together had we worked together to... I've had a few sparks ask me to kind of help them how to, they want to sometimes overdo the technical jargon. Yeah. And so they want to write it very technically. So I'll say, well, this is how you write it technically, but now let's, let's come backwards. Let's translate it technically to then make it simple. Um, and it's just something that you develop with experience. Oh, smash the place up. Sorry. Right. Now we're going to get on to the fun bits. So what we're going to do on this one is we're just going to code it. Hopefully you've all had enough time to, Look at it. This is the only one that we are actually... Oh, I think I broke my computer. You broke your computer? I think I actually have broke my... Well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to scan through the chat through that last that piece that you just done. Um, well, okay, there's Jack going up there. Uh, so we talked about photos, and so the, some of the guys are saying, um, I certify vestibular electroform and the NICIC as well, we think. Uh, David says you can also do that as well. Um, but that's adding yeah, photos that's, good. Uh, that's adding photos but also get on the photo a little timestamp yeah? yeah just 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 a little dated timestamp on the photo itself um just just so that you know it's got that little traceability there okay so what we're going to do on this one we're going to code this one the rest of them i'm going to leave the codes on the screen okay. um because everyone may agree 
may disagree. Um, maybe we can take the debate outside of the photo. Uh, the, I think the question is, is on these photos, there may not be a, any individual is not wrong, but what we need to do is have that collective debate as to our engineering logic and our perception of risk. EICRs to me is a perception of risk. Yeah, risk is the identification of obviously hazards, um, as you can see from that photo. So what, what have we got there, um, lads? We've got uh, an old, looks like an old. A pre-SMK. Yeah, it looks like an old MK one, doesn't it? The old 3871 breakers. Yeah. Someone's obviously done a, um, a very dodgy modification um, where they've looks like they've extended the cables to run something. You've got the uh, a CPC with connector block. It's You've got a, an innovation of a one penny piece used to um, kind of act like a lug in some form to keep a uh, stranded cable compressed against the buzz bar so they could nick a supply from obviously a board that was full. So you're the inspector, you've gone in, you've checked your bonding because any inspector doing any ICR should be checking the bonding first. Um, before doing anything else. Why? Because it's good practice. Because if your earthing or other suitable precaution isn't there, why would you carry on? In the, the day, you're interfering with an installation where you could give rise to danger. And oh, yeah, and anything you do can make that existing situation less safe, and your work should never create a less safe scenario. Yep, I, I've stopped. I've made it a point of principle where any EICR I've done or my subbies do, if there isn't sufficient earthing and bonding, they stop immediately. Mm -hmm. Period. Um, so, what do you do? You walk in, you see that. What what code do you put for that? What do you think, JW? That one, I put C2. Why? Because it's not an approved connection method. And someone's put in the, in the chat that copper coins conduct really well. Well, copper coins aren't actually made of solid copper. So uh, conductivity is a question in that one. So. so what you've just done, John, you've just given us your two pence on that. That's right. That's right. Hey, well, well, I'm here well all done. night. Yeah, I'm here well all night. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> these jokes are awful. Um, yeah, no, I agree. Um, you could, yeah, definitely connection methods incorrect, not in line with manufacturer's assembly. Um, yeah. um, there's many things that would come up with a C2. Where, what would be happening for you to elevate that to a C1? Uh, ooh. Well, for me, thermal, would, maybe thermal, maybe yeah, of definitely, thermal. definitely signs of thermal damage, uh, loose connections, um, damage to the, the buzz bar, any cracks or div visible cracks or splits in the copper or, or conductor material, thermal damage to the breakers above, um, you know, black or soot deposits. Um, to be honest with you, it's a C2, even if those weren't there, mm. that, that earth with a connector block extending on it, I, anything <laughs> to do with earthing, I see to it straight away. Mm. If it's if it's prevalent for safety, it, it goes as a C2 with me. And that's, some people may argue with it, but again, I don't work to the regulations or even to the code breaker book. I work from it all. This is just informed guidance and my own engineering judgment. The and other thing this is that those, what's, what's the overload protection for those two wires? Because that's coming direct off the bus bar. What overload protection, John? Exactly. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. So, that's so we can just, we can tell everybody this is actually John Ward's consuming unit at his house. So it's taken last no it's not it's not it's dave's no um yeah so what's everyone saying on the chat majority so, of pushing c2 through um david says c2 but c1 if euros are used oh just totally <laughs> agree there if it's a euro it's a c1 yeah uh, absolutely completely agree and he says if there's thermal effects c1 so that i always i kind of play this devil's advocate in my mind when i look at coding i go okay if i'm thinking it's a c2 what would i have to see to go to c1 what would i have to not see for it to be a c3 just so that i can kind of understand where i've come to my position so okay let's let's change this up a little bit let's say that's in a a consumer unit in a nursery okay mm -hmm. so what advice would you then give to the owners of the nursery compared to say a domestic homeowner who has said but i've lived here for 20 years it works fine thank you very much for your interference because this is the one man the one man domestic yeah. guy here trying to avail an opportunity use his risk management knowledge to prevent people getting killed or a house burning down i mean both of them result in c2 which result in unsatisfactory observations so fundamentally the outcome is the same um homeowners you know yeah uh, if they say that they, it's been there for years and stuff then you just you just keep it simple uh if you've got nurseries and things so you just have to you know let them understand the the consequence of this risk what would happen if they don't take action give a bit more information on that 
so with uh, customers or people saying oh it's worked for years i don't need to change it yeah. that comes up all the time all the time yeah and it's, you just have to explain to them that yeah it might have worked for years but there's a big difference between something working and something actually being safe so uh, something working is on its own doesn't really tell you a whole lot and it's uh, it's like the it's like the argument for surge protection where people say i'm not having uh, you know a hundred pound surge protection device protecting my home but yet the iPhone 11 Max Pro is 1,600 pound. Yeah. They'll pay for that, but they won't pay for a device that can protect all of their electronics. Mm. And trust me, I think <laughs> a lot more electronics are going to be appearing in houses and a lot more protection I mean, is going to be required. Kirsty has that wonderful slide that she uses, which has, is it, is it, um, Oh, the statistics one. Yeah, yeah. Someone provided them with that, where it shows you technology we used ten, fifteen years ago, technology we use today. Everybody yeah. needs a new TV every six or seven years, so everyone's got a new smart TV. And a lot of these newer toys now are much more susceptible than they used yep. to be. Um, so it's not a question of oh, I've never needed it before. It's you've 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 basically over the past 10, 20 years, you naturally have evolved your technology by buying a new thing. You mm -hmm. know? I think, I think this, is, this is the debate here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reveal what we've kind of... This is the only one that will actually, if it works, if my computer works, that is. It's, hopefully this works. So there we go. we've kind of, on an initial assessment, gauged it as a C2. However, some bloke called Phil Watts, don't know who he is, um, but he says C1, and a number of other people, Paul Jarman, um, Alan Wilson, um, mm -hmm. and a few other guys, they say C1. And do you know what? Dependent on the installation, I don't know if I could probably walk away from that. I would most certainly be issuing a danger notification form. Just realised that Phil Watts is in chat. Hi. <laughs> Hi, yeah. Dad. All right. Yeah. Oh, is he tell me who... Yeah, Just, Phil Watts. Unless it's another Phil Watts. Yeah, there may be. You never know. Um, yeah. But, but yeah. there is the guys and guys and girls. Absolutely, the minute you see that, that's either a, a danger notification form with a very clear explanation, or it's uh, quoting for a, a change because no, this is, it's not this really good enough to leave Phil's that there. Added, so I wouldn't argue with a C one. Yeah. Phil's added. The reason is his personal assessment. C one is the immediate remedial action. The C two doesn't require the immediate remedial, and that's why he pushes it to C one because it pushes him to get rid of the freaking penny washers and that's why he's thinking c1 which i can't disagree with yeah because again if we look at the definitions again of and um c2 is potentially dangerous yeah. urgent remedial action required okay so there's no definition or guidance on what the remedial action or how how what timeline you put to urgent remedial action is mm. in c1 it's immediate remedial action required and my brain would want to fix that there and then yeah, which would ruin my day and that's why Phil's used to C1, and I get that. But then again, the, pra the, pra the pragmatic approach to the domestic installer is he may have jobs booked in, okay? He, he has to, to a certain extent, yes, be passionate and caring mm. and involved, but he can't sit and trust me. When I was on the tools doing domestic, I genuinely would leave people's houses at like 11, 12 o'clock at night okay. because I wanted them to be protected. All right, so let's say that you're in someone's house, you've yep. seen this, and you're going, yeah. I'm going to go C2, and you're going to put the lid back on, and you're going to leave it like that. So you're leaving that in service. Yeah. You think, do you think that's okay with the ethical standards that we've been reading so far? Um, I would, to be honest with you, before I put the lid back on, I'd get the homeowners, um, and even if I had to wait for them to come home and explain to whoever the owner of the house was or get the landlord down and say, listen, this, this really needs fixing now. This is just a ticking time fire basically mm. waiting to happen. Um, and effectively, I would only put the lid back on um, if I was coming back to do the board change, to be perfectly frank. I would definitely issue a danger notification. But the fact of the matter is, is if you go purist on it, again, just on that photo, there's no signs of thermal damage. Nope. If I check it for tightness and it's tight, yeah, it's, I mean, it, it's completely wrong in every way, shape or form. It's a C2 with a danger notification. It might but be the, that that feeds a bit of equipment that's not actually used a lot or isn't used. Yeah. A lot. So there are some things you can do to engineer your judgment. Um, yes. Let me get this the perception of risk, isn't it? That's the fun of if, this, I guess. If I see if I see that that picture there, there is a risk of immediate danger to the homeowner, I go straight to C1. Yeah? If I see that that is a dog shit, excuse my language, dog shit lash up, that just the person who did it just, just needs to be banned from the industry. If I see that, then immediately it's potential dangerous. It needs to be rem rem remedied. But if I'm not paid by the customer, 
to do it, then the only thing I can do is discharge my legal duty of care as a skilled, competent person and hope that I keep records to argue in case the judge asks me why I didn't do it. Does your coding opinion change if this is a private tenant or a rented property? Doesn't change at all. The only thing you would, would make the same thing if that. So if, the, if you're in a property that's going to be rented and you know that it might take up to 28 days for this to be remedied. I don't generally factor in okay. how the property is owned or rented. I'll be honest with you. The one thing that always facts in for me for domestic always was um, families, mm. young families, young children, um, lone mothers, Stuff like that, pull at the heartstrings. Oh, amount of times I would look around. Persons. Amount of times I'd be at a fuse box and I'd be thinking, okay, risk, and I'd be looking for the little kids' shoes or the little coats, you know, and, and I just that would just help me understand the the, the building better uh, and the element of risk, especially right. when the fuse board was underneath the uh, where the, Dave, board, the books were. Yeah. Let's start. Let's do a poll. Let's start plowing through these now. All um, right, John. Just just briefly can you explain well? it and run, run a poll. What do we see? It's crap in it really. <laughs> right, I'm gonna I'm gonna launch a <coughs> poll. Yeah. If you all don't do it, but if this covers your screen up, then uh, then because uh, some of you guys might be on phones, and I won't keep up for too long. I'll just do it for a couple of a couple of seconds, really. So um, yeah, this is John. Do you want? Is this is this one of yours, John? No, it's not one of mine. Right. Okay. So this is one I got. So, oh, hang on. There's this something's appeared in front of my screen. So the coding poll. Yeah. Um, so. Basically, what well, that was one, that was one that was sent in. I think that's on our Instagram. This is the general find daily of a domestic installer when they're crawling through a loft. Uh, somebody wants, and let's be honest about it, in the 90s, again, my personal opinion, forgive me. Mm. In the 90s, the industry went mad with these sodding halogen downlighters. And they were a curse, but they were also a great money earner. And, uh, and it's fair to say a lot of manufacturers didn't really manufacture their luminaires where you could loop a three plate wiring system in very well. So then became the um, oh, they still mass, haven't really. it's the mass on... sales of hmm. uh, 20 amp lighting junction boxes. Yeah. Um, and we guys were ended up just using any form of junction box. And as you can see there, you've got what one, two, three, four, five cables at least going into there. So some well, that's the problem tried... that I think they had like five terminals, didn't they? They had one, two, yeah, three, five, four, terminal, five, 20 amp junction boxes. I've still got have, some in the shed. When you have two way switching, you run out of space. You CPCs take an exit, don't they? Yeah. Um, and I, I, somewhere I've, I think in some of the other slideshows, I've probably got better ones where people have craftily twisted them around the lid and done all mm -hmm. sorts of fancy stuff. But this is the stuff you're calling through a loft and you immediately think it's the middle of summer. Oh man, this is a nightmare. So what's everybody coding it as? Um, I I can't code it because I I, I said it's the analysts can't code. That's we fine, have that's got uh, one C one, sixty nine C twos, and seventeen C threes. Two Ooh. FIs. So far. So I'll end okay. the poll. I'll end the poll, and we'll just look at the. I can then share the result. C2, C3, FI. I like, I like the use of FI because the persons who have used FI have gone, this is going to be a headache of a lighting circuit. How big is this problem? Um, and yeah, I, I'm also, by the way, I'm on, I, I don't know if I'm the only person who, I actually use more than one code for certain things. So I might, I might see three FI a lot of stuff um, just because of time restraints and what I've seen is bad. So I need to use mm -hmm. the coding as best to explain. Well, that's uh, why you have British. those lovely codes with the observations. You can just put the codes that you need to with the observations. Mm -hmm. um, this is, yeah. I mean, when you see something like this in a loft space, the first thing you're going to want to do is obviously assess the risk here. But then you're going to want to look further at the connections to the luminaires themselves to see if there's another connector, to, you know, a, a taped connector box floating or another joint or something. Okay, so let's let's debate the issue then. So, um, seventy percent of said, seventy eight percent of said C two. Okay, C2, potentially dangerous, urgent remedial action required. So, what's the potential danger then? Yeah. What is the potential? So, I would argue um, terminations um, straight away. Um, the fact that the terminations aren't secure because um, now they will be secure inside the junction box via the brass screws, but the actual unit, as you can see from that, is just floating. Well, yeah. So um, these these drone boxes have holes underneath them for the for fixing. The manufacturers specify they shall be fixed, and the cables going into them shall be mechanically sound, clipped, and all that. They shouldn't float. They shouldn't wave in the air. 
Indeed. So um, straight away, I could look at uh, extents, um, section 522, Five. selection and mm -hmm. erection of wiring systems, external influences, impact. You know, I could be crawling Five. along the installation. Five. 526 is connections, and in there you'll find about the need for the cables to have mechanical and electrical continuity. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and the fact that it could be covered in loft insulation, derating of the insulation. Mm -hmm. um, I've, you know, known, I've known a few, though, to say, but this is in the loft space, so that, you know, it's actually, you know, there's, because you've got single insulation there, you don't have the sheathing. Um, is a loft space an enclosure? Because some people do think that they think no. it's not readily accessible. Well, it's in a lost on, space. It depends on the person accessing it, isn't it? And in a domestic, in particular, where the person's yeah. going up there are not authorised or skilled persons. They're no, they're not. They're not skilled. And when you're selecting, erecting in, an installation, look at Appendix Five. The the use is is the installation under the control of a skilled person who has sufficient skills and knowledge to understand that a single sheathed conductor could give rise to danger through degradation and damage the fact of the matter is that was covered in insulation so you immediately have a, a thermal issue a thermal issue where you can derate the current carrying capacity conductor you've then got section 526 which is your electrical connections because they're not installed in line with any manufacturer's instructions of that joint box you've then got the fact that you've got a risk of a, a, a rising impedance or a loose connection of a cpc which is a requirement for safety so i'm going to go with the c2s so if you've observed that this has thermal insulation on top of it, yeah. do you just remove the thermal insulation and then potentially impact the house's energy performance categories? Or do you then go, oh, I'll have to FI this and then actually calculate the impact of that thermal insulation if that value of duration is not there for you and the calculations? I have found when I've had to crawl through loss doing these, I will always uncover the insulation from electrical connections and mm -hmm. I would rather leave it there um, and allow it to dis the heat to dissipate. And I will just tell the customer that I've left the insulation exposed with the C2 recommendations. Would they like me to come back and do it? Would they like me to do it now? It's, Most times it won't be now. Mm. Um, it's worth remembering, obviously, obviously we comply with BS7671 on this, but if you go to the building regulations and you go to energy performance, there is a bit that says about spacing being needed for the luminaires. Um, yep. So you can always kind of just point people to that if they moan about it. But I would agree. I remember actually putting... Okay. Um, I would put spaces over. I, I I was doing some work in a bungalow, um, and all of the, the all of these uh, non fire rated downlights. It was a bungalow, so I wasn't going to upgrade to fire rated because there wasn't a habitable space above. But the insulation was right over the top of them, and it was cooking them. So we got some um, soil pipe, and we just cut that down. We just made little tubes, so little vents to go into the thermal insulation, just to kind of vent it up. Mm -hmm. You know, we had to create these little things, these little. Um, Indeed. Oh, right. Should we move on to the next one? Is there any more comments or? Uh, the majority of a couple of people are talking about um, obviously mechanical strain and the CPC is not sheathed at all uh, in some parts where they go into these jun junction boxes. Sometimes they see that there's no sheathing at all in the CPC. Um, I definitely think it's a C2 of an FI on this. I think, I think, yeah, I think I can understand why some people would say if it's in a void space in a building that's non-domestic that they might think about authorization access less risk. In domestic, though, we'd have to see to this. I think. Right. Okay. What we're going to do FI now as well is we are going to speed these up because we're going to pretend we're on a drive-by now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to stop sharing the result on that one. Right. Next one. Uh, is this any of ours? Who's who's is this? Do we this? Well, well. Sorry, this, on. this was this wasn't one of John's. I don't think. Um, I think this was sent on an Instagram. Uh, again, this is the Revenge of the Plumber. Yeah. Um, that's uh, one of the lads sent that to me, head under a floorboard. You can see where the plumber's obviously done his joints on his copper pipe, pretty much melted the sheath. I think that was a shower circuit, if I remember rightly. Uh, you can also see that it looks like pitch as well, which is leaking yeah. from above it. I'd be um, interested to see what's above that. Yeah, I never got the photo above. It was just, it was, look yeah. what we found underneath. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's one of the common problems that Spark have. Uh, Spark have, it's just rubbish, really, to be honest with you. Um, it's just lazy, sloppy plumbers. Um, we're seeing, yeah, what do you guys think? We're seeing a lot of see ones. Let's run the poll just to see if anyone actually wants to creep in a different opinion. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to try and speed these guys. So vote quickly, vote with your head, pretend you're on site and you've got a hell of a lot of work to do. Pretend we're making you do four a day. <laughs> Yeah. Come on. 
I mean, the fund, we've, got, we've obviously got the impact here of a problem, but what we've got is the absence of the, uh, the regulation where it says about prevention of mutual detrimental influences here, mm -hmm. where we've clearly got you know, one tradie not working well with the other. It's interesting we're getting a lot of C1s. I think that's because they're looking at there's clearly damage to that cable on the left. Mm. Uh, obviously, the heating scorching there is evident of the sweating work by the by the plumber. We assume. Yeah, well, it's it's damaged the external sheath, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you can kind of almost see the colouring of what looked like the neutral through where it's melted, but I can't see any exposed copper uh, on that cable. So from again, I'm playing devil's advocate here Go while you it. guys are doing your thing. I can't see exposed copper, and that would be a C1 danger present. Um, definitely it's a potentially dangerous surgeon remedial action because the cable's been subjected to thermal issues. It needs ripping out, it needs rewiring and replacing. Um, but is there an immediate danger given the okay. fact it's placed out of reach? Right, so it's out of reach, it's, it's not accessible. So if there is any damaged insulation there, they're not readily exposed and live. Would there be any need to do any further tests or inspections to actually understand this risk more? Yeah. Or visually, is, there, is that adequate, do you think? Uh, I think to me that's a uh, as a as a minimum it's a C2 with an FI to verify the integrity of the circuit. Again, I'm just impact. curious. This is based on me sticking my head under a floorboard and seeing that visually. Um, the cable is damaged. I can't see exposed copper from what I can see. Um, the circuit may have had its integrity impeded, which is fine. Um, well, it isn't fine. So I need to do further investigation, mm. um, without a doubt. So. For me, I would C2FI that. I know everyone's going to hate yeah. me for saying that, <laughs> but it's purely based on that. I wouldn't begrudge anyone C1 in it, but I would be saying, where's the danger present, the immediate risk of injury, um, or the, the need for immediate remedial action? But I, 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 immediately, investigation. I immediately want to get closer to that cable to see if there is exposed conductor, and I want to test that, because obviously inspection and testing so it might be that i haven't tested this yet and it might be under an ir test i can actually confirm that there is damage to this cable mm -hmm. um but again that cable might not be damaged so much that the yep. testing would find that problem so yep. you know this kind of inspection just you know increases the need for us to take inspection seriously yeah and, and i agree with sean the pitch leaking is a separate issue um pitch generally leaks slowly over time to honest with you so it's it's never generally boiling hot when it touches the cable, um, it's something that just slowly slithers down. But we'll, I think we'll cover that in our DNO webinar. Yeah, in our DNO, yeah. In our DNO webinar, right? Um, okay, so I'm going to C2 FI or C1 FI. Um, that's what yeah. I would do. Um, We've got 85% C1s. Wow. Okay. So I think I think what's happening there is a lot of people just seeing the drama, mm -hmm. and I think that's also having that impact that that that. The drama of what's gone on obviously escalates it into C1 territory, um, which is justifiable. Um, is it immediate yeah. dangerous uh, though? You'd have to have some. The fact of the matter is, is the the remedial is is I would uh, as an inspector I would probably find that circuit and I would put a mega across it as a minimum before I left, mm. just to see whether it is. And if I've got low insulation re readings, then I'll jump that C2 to an F uh, C1. And say, so, yeah, okay. That, right. So your F, has... so your CTFI, but your FI might result in readings that go from C2 up to C1. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't begrudge anyone who did a C1 slash FI um, as well, to be perfectly frank, because again, it, the engineering judgment, the perception of risk is within the individual and, and their knowledge and experience at the end hmm. of the day. And yeah, so I, I, w I wouldn't argue the toss. What I would say is just remember C1 is danger is present immediate risk of injury immediate remedial action required so if it's out of reach of uninstructed persons then you could have somebody from an industry body say well it's actually a c2 but so just be wary but again it's it's the, the risk is in the eye of the beholder um just moving on to the next one yep. look at this dog's dinner <clears throat> that was that was actually found so Excuse me. For anyone who's not aware, um, there's an old meter on the top. I think it was an old ABB one or Sangamo one. And the thing next to it is the old time clocks, which used to take their feed off of the meter and, and then switch out um, a little contact in the meter and give you uh, two rate systems. That's how that was found. I just want to just want to um, respond to a comment. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Paul has said here, if you're using the software, 
yeah, to report electronically, could you actually give two codes? That's down to the, I mean, you, sh you should be able to use them. I would hope so. But if you I'm... can't, that's the example where software restricts what you can do. It's one yeah. of the reasons why I don't like many softwares um, yeah. because they do, they do try to, you know, auto complete and they do try to lead you on. You should have the freedom to do the reporting the way you want to. If your yeah. software restricts your reporting ability, you've got to choose a different software. Well, it's, it's limiting no. your uh, assessment is, and application is, of engineering judgment. Yeah, this is where we hear names like Electroform, because Electroform always appear to be listening to what electricians are talking about and trying to adjust and modify their software. So try other softwares to see if it gives you the freedom that you want. Yeah, I like Electroform. Um, mm. I just want to show you, he's, I've talked to him about a lot of things and he does it. Um, right, that's a C1 every day of the week. I think that's fairly evident. Is, what, is, this, is this how it was? Yeah, oh. that was found. This, is, oh, yeah. this wasn't an inspector who turned up and took covers off. This is how oh. it was found. And this was in a, this... um, it was in the back of a house in like what was a converted old uh, like toilet block where someone had just battened it in. There was evidently a new supply put in there at some point and this was the lash up that the builder had done. Right. So this, this was not an electrician who did it. This was a builder who'd done it. Um, and I believe they'd moved the fuse board to somewhere nice, and they also ran a supply out to a shed. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's just a C1. It's just a mess, really, isn't it? It just needs to be sorted. But um, does everyone agree? Mm. Typical builders, yes. It's pretty much. Nice Sadly, the balance yeah. of risk and future work is is I, I find the best way of working with builders is to educate them, mm. educate them in the realms of you can make more money but you must listen to me. Help me. Take me on that journey with you. So, sorry, I didn't catch it. This, this, this scenario, was this immediately readily accessible? Yes. Okay. Yes, this is, this is how the guy found it. Yeah, it's a C1 um, then. If it's yeah, really, it's a C1 it's every day of the week. For me, it so, is. It's a, it's a quick win. Um, do you want to show you C1 due to evidence? Yeah, okay, let's end that one and share that one. Right, C1, 98% of you bang on. That's fairly, fairly... Uh, firm on that one. I agree with the C3s as well, by the way, and the C2s, because it, it's just crap and it needs improving. Um, again, this is where problems there. So yeah, it's C1. You got C2 for the armor's not connected, and yeah, it, all the codes basically. So yeah, there are many it's observations in one in one picture. There. So maybe people can watching it's a, as a practice method. See how many codes you can pull out of this. How many regulations does this one picture give you? <laughs> um, it's a good way of writing up your reports. When do you stop? Um, right, moving on. If yep. this computer works, I don't know why my computer is acting incredibly slow. Um, I think Ooh, this lovely. is lovely. John's. Is this one of yours, John? No, it's not. Oh, fuck. It. I don't know where you got it from. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've got thousands and thousands of. I asked for photos on social media and I just got all overwhelmed. So I now have just mass Ooh, catalogs of it. So, many. so this is a classic. All right, is the, cover, the cover is off on this one, yeah? Uh, the cover is off, by the way. It wasn't right. found like that. The cover okay. is off. So this is one of the classic Wilexes that John Ward owns. Um, it's a vulcanized Indian rubber supply. Um, wooden, wooden for those who may not have seen that, which is just um, the tails here on the main switch. It's a yeah. double pole isolator. And this used to be full of rewirable uh, 3036s. And then Wilex, in their wisdom, uh, came up with the 3871 push fit yeah. and it's being upgraded with the 60898 trip switch equivalents with the 3ka rating um how would you go about coding that well is it immediately it's dangerous oh no uh, what's the condition of the vir below the board that's a thing that i want to see now you i think know, most people would uh, again i'm gonna i'm gonna just dive in here really hmm. i think c3 is the default everybody the minute you see it and you see vir you're just thinking straight away c3 but then when you start looking at it and you think about right got to look at its condition circuits yeah you know do i touch vir because it can fall apart is it flaking you, your brain works from a c3 fi into mm. a ct c2 <clears throat> fi and depending on your extent of limitations you may actually turn around and say yeah. well this this could potentially be a c1 because you can see some idiots twisted all the cpcs together what happens if you untwist them and they'll break you don't have any earth continuity. It may be that that installation is life expired. Well, that's a good point because obviously that twisted protective conductors there, gonna, they're going to be that compromises your ability to inspect it. And if the electrical installation is compromising your ability to properly inspect it and maintain it, 
it must be considered as, as life expired at that point if you can't maintain it effectively. Yeah, yeah this I mean, I'd, I'd go for a C2. Um, and quite honestly, if I found, if went somewhere I haven't been before, found that, then I'd be telling the customer, there's not going to be a whole lot of point in inspecting the rest of this installation because if you start taking light switches off and you've got that kind of wiring behind, just taking the switch off is going to cause that insulation to fall off and degrade and fall to bits. So mm -hmm. this is definitely one where continuing with an inspection on this is probably not worth it because you're going to cause more problems just by actually, say, taking a socket off and having a look behind. So, so John, what mm. you've successfully done is you've done one of your four-a-day EICRs in about a minute. Congratulations. Well done. It's possible. It's got, to, it's got to do a certificate yet, though. <laughs> um, yes, indeed. Um, just looking at the main switch, if you look at the line conductor there, or the live, as we called it, you can see the fabric of the VIR is coming off. I personally, when I opened that up, I would immediately sit under the cupboard and just put my head down and go, oh, for flip's sake, have a look round, have a nosy, maybe get a ZS reading and just go, do you know what? It is absolutely pointless going with this. So I personally would see to it with an FI um, and just say rewire required. To be honest with you, I, I just, I wouldn't waste the, the energy or any more money and just bill them for a, a couple of hours and move on. All right. So with that, not worth okay, it. so you've, you've made an initial life observation. Expired. You've yep. made an initial observation that the switch gear is yes. life expired. Yes, but also the cabling is potentially life expired because I can see that the cabling is flaking and, and, and flaying. Mm -hmm. I don't want to bring, I don't want to bring rise of danger to that installation by interfering or touching it. Yeah. So you at that point are going to put a C2 in, yeah. which is not immediate roomy ribbity, but is still unsatisfactory. Yes. And you're going to stop doing your inspection at that point. Yeah. All right. So you're going to have to then at that point detail specifically yep. what you have inspected because it could be that there is a hidden danger in this system, yep. a C1, a potential fatality, which you've now, you're now not going to see because you've chosen to stop. Yeah. But the so if you do is, do that, you need to make sure you document clearly why you stopped and where you stopped. The tr and again, it yeah. comes down to the, it comes down to extent. I mean, if I was in a, this, this more than likely is a pensioner's home. Um, at the end of the day, because mm -hmm. I've been in loads of old people's homes where they've still got lead twin, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you are right. I mean, Place, I could, yeah. I could well, at that board, I could do a ZS, PFC, PSCC. I can check the earthing, presence of equipotential bonding. Um, what else can I do? I could switch the main switch off. I could maybe um, put an insulation resistance across mm -hmm. the board to see whether I do actually have any insulation resistance values to gauge the condition to see whether it's worth doing anything else. But as ge a general rule of thumb, having just dealt with a recent VIR installation that pretty much fell apart, um, I personally wouldn't touch it because I don't want to take responsibility for the alteration and addition. Mm -hmm. And that's the trouble. The minute I touch it, I could be deemed as altering it. And I don't want that. So for me, it's a, a C2 with an FI. Um, and I mean, I could offer, look, I can, I'll visually check sockets and lights and stuff like that for direct access but it would still be an unsatisfactory. I could walk around and say, look, yeah, your lights work. Your switches are all in good. Pro there's no cracks. There's no signs of thermal damage, but your board, the wiring is 60, 70 years old. There's signs of degradation on the cabling. Um, your insulation values are low. You haven't got a potential bonding. It's a failure. I recommend a full bonding scheme and a, and a rewire of a new consumer unit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think it would be. Yeah. You're right. I mean, I'll, you know, old, old homes, old homes, uh, other places. I also see this, um, not this board particularly, but similar would be landlord communal systems where the flats are often upgraded, but sometimes the landlord communal part um, does get sometimes left behind. And I see that sometimes. Right. So I'm going, going to C2. What did everybody right. else come up with? C2 we've, got, we've got a C2, uh, 67%. We've got 3% C1, 13% C3. Right. So, there we go. And 17% 17, 17 FI. That's a good FI one, that one. Okay. John? This is definitely one of yours. <laughs> no, it's not. It's tears. You, you, I'm sure you sent me this one. This is going to become a repeat thing, isn't it? Right, this yeah, is John Ward's work. Um, no, so this is an installation um, where, well, from what it looks like is someone who's spurred off a socket, which is sideways, to add another socket, and then they've spurred off of that. So where would you start with this? How would you look at this as far as a codable observation? Lack of mechanical protection on the cabling? possible uh strain on the conductors in the back well, yeah um the the method isn't technically no. Um, no. sound no 
it's sheathed cable. It's a mess, really, isn't it? I don't know if there's a bit of exposed singles at the point of connection to the socket. I can't see. Um, poor, poor erection methods. Um, I think Simon Goodship has nailed it um, for me. C3 with, without further information on the situation. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there's so, nothing obviously oh. dangerous for what you can see. I mean, the cables are there. They're not sort of exposed live parts or anything. No, and it could be, you know, it could be a spur off of a spur, but we know that, you know, depending yeah. on the, the actual loads that you plug in, that might not be a problem. I think the biggest thing for me is just the fact the way the cabling has been lashed in. Um, yeah. It's just no due care and consideration for mechanical protection of it. And and that straight away, I've always said, mm. strain placed upon conductors <laughs> is a key well, thing. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is one of those things, though. I mean, you know, you can look at a job and go, oh, that's shit. Um, you can't necessarily write that down. You have a comment, observations and comments, and you can then gently write down that it's shit. Um, but in this case, yeah, um, if you're looking for a sound regulation, you're looking mainly at yeah. the electrician the, the was connection. an artist, so decided to run cables in a a 45 degree angle, trying to create an artwork which didn't quite become an artwork. Um, what's everyone think? Are we all going C3? C3. We've got five percent C2, eighty six percent C3. Yeah, I could see I could see why the C twos if that was in a nursery or something yeah. like that. I'd, but again, I'd... yeah, it's it's relative to where this is. This could be in a nursery. This could be in a cupboard. I mean, we're assuming domestic in this webinar. Yeah. So domestically, um, yeah, location, risk of impact, utilization, maybe. Might I remember a lot of C2. homes. A lot of homes. A lot of domestic homes are used as nurseries now. A lot of them are converted, aren't they? They're downstairs yeah. for nurseries. It's a it's a up and coming business model. It would appear. Mm. Right. Okay. Well, we'll we'll leave that as a C three. I I agree. I think it's a C three with a little bit more investigation needed. Definitely. Here's another one uh, which John is going to say he didn't say to send to me. No. no. I did all the, these. Are all the Instagram ones. I think first. Um... Oh, okay. Fair enough. We'll just shout, John, when it's yours. Um, right, here's a lash up. Um, and I think I don't think there's a code for lash up other than C3. But um, one, two, three, four, there's uh, what, five conductors? In a, now, I'll tell you what, the person who did that, round of applause, you're an utter fool. That's, that's, that's patience, some work. That is, yeah, that must have taken a little that's, bit of... That's determination. Mm. I mean, that's, yeah, that's... Uh, mm. Um, so you open it up and immediately you just go, oh, God's sake. Now, I would see one, the wallpaper, straight away, because that is just it's, awful. It's for reasons like this why a lot of electricians <laughs> um, just sample the bare minimum, because they'll lower that and then those little cables will come out. And technically, Eureka, you found a problem, but then they'll be going, oh, for fuck's sake, because they've then got to either fix it or they've got to then put all the pain and effort that the guy who originally put it in has to do as well. Yeah, that's just... How many, a... times have you, how many times have you had a pair of pin nose pliers and you've been trying to push that cable back in, you know, where they're too short because the idiot before you also did that and he didn't tell you not to take that socket down ever again in the future? Long nose pliers, yeah. I, yeah. yeah. I shed a tear when I see them. Um, so straight away, just playing devil's advocate here. Um, while everybody... If you could do a code um, thing on this... Yep. Um, and then the lug breaks. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Jesus. So for me, straight away, I open that and I think, well, first of all, there's evidently damp in the wall because that box is corroding. There is. There is definitely some. So the back box is corroding. I'm mm. not seeing much mechanical protection on the cables as they enter the box. No. Some, um, somebody knew about grommets, but, but didn't really. So what's happened there? They put the grommet in, but then the cable's been put in afterwards or it's pushed the grommet in as they pulled it or it's pulled it as they pulled it. So... Um... I'm also seeing definitely when that gets put back, a massive strain placed upon the conductors. You can see even the, one of the neutrals there turning white where it's being pinched mm -hmm. uh, just in the centre of the screen there. You can see the line conductor coming out to the top and the right, you see the right hand line conductor, the red one? Yeah. The top of that has thinned a bit as it's been worn, probably brushing yeah, the absolutely. ceiling of the socket as it's been pushed in there. You then got the old green sleeving as well for the CPC. Um, mm -hmm. I, do you know what? Without knowing any more, um, I think it's a C3 and an FI. Mm -hmm. I do. I think it's assuming, a yeah, assuming that everything else is technically okay. We have RCDs. We have a you know an accessory that's not damaged. Is there any risk or is there any evidence of uh, thermal impact, thermal effects in there? Doesn't look like it. Um, um, do you know what? If I was, if again, one of the things I, I like to do, and I know Dave, you you think it's quite good, is I like to tie these into EAWR as well. So just on this, yes. I could probably argue regulation five and seven 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, insulation protection and placing of conductors. So it'd be covered, protected to prevent danger. I don't think that connection is in compliance with the AWR Regulation 7. To be perfectly frank, I'm sure somebody will probably argue with me. And strength and capability of electro electrical equipment. You know, that socket's designed for a certain loading. That circuit may get far, the cables in it will be far greater load if, um, if you've got the entire ring final, you know, 30 amps flowing through the back of it. That could put strain upon the conductor, on the connection, on the plastics around it. Um, I just think it's a bodge which could give rise to danger. So I think it's a C3FI, but it could easily be a C2FI as well if you were going to tie it into the hierarchy of electricity or work regulations. Which an electrician in a domestic home, if you're employed by a contractor, you are privy to electricity at work regulations. Don't think you're exempt. Um, but okay, yeah, let's see what everyone's fly. done. This is a fairly good. good, fairly good mix on this one. Yeah, do you know what? There's there's merit for both, and it's good to see different different balances of engineering judgment there, different right. perceptions of risk. You know, it's but the this is if. why we get this is why we get the questions all the time about is it yeah. C two is it C three because again people have differences of opinion, different interpretation here. I think it's a, it's not a matter of that photo of will an issue happen. It's mm. an issue of when it will happen. Okay, so what do we? I mean, okay, so you've just gone through. You've come up with a C three FI, correct? Yeah, just okay. just based on that visual alone. Mm -hmm. um, but so what would escalate you here to the C two? Knowing my luck, putting it back and it going bang. <laughs> Knowing my luck. Um, maybe a sound of crackling, maybe evidence that the connection is not sound if there's excessive Well, and that's the thing as well. It's, it's, it's observing the installation in use as well, isn't it? This is mm -hmm. where the inspection and testing of it, because you could find you put the socket back fine, mm -hmm. and then you, you're going around doing ZS values, having confirmed polarity, but when you're putting your plug in, you then start hearing an arcing noise from inside, which may tell you that the screw has failed. It may have you know, been damaged or something like that. And there is an mm. arcing within that lug that would then straight away make me go, I'm going to see to that circuit. Mm. I've also seen it before where people would take a spur from a socket and then they'd actually bring another cable back and they'd actually connect a ring from that spur. And so, then all of those extra cables, we're putting a lot of loading in. So you need to look at the loading Ian, on that circuit. Ian says he can't see the point in coding it two different codes as they both result in unsatisfactory. Yes, you're absolutely right. They do both result in unsatisfactory, but this is you defining the logic of your engineering reasoning and judgment. So this is like if I was a judge and as I, we showed earlier on the judge saying, what was your decision-making process? Well, it, improvement was recommended, but also I needed to investigate it further. Mm. Now, if you write that down, that's fine. You can then use one code but that, that logic should be defined somewhere within your observations. This is, my, this is what makes the good engineering judgment and the good um, observation of risk, which makes a better EICR. To me, to me, there's just FI because I need more information. I need to know what impact the, with the resistance those cables are having with the loading that will push me possibly into C2 territory from that. Yeah, if there's no that. evidence of loading or issues like that, it might be down C3. Manufacturer might not like that many cables as well. I'd have to look into that. So there's a bit of FI work to do. Yeah, I mean, all these, most of these are going to have some further investigation needed. Mm. It's just whether you can do it at the time or not. And, yeah. and it could be that you, when you're doing this, you turn around and you make your first observation is there is further, there is further, um, uh, further investigation required on this installation um, based on time limitations and observations of potential defects or hazards found within the installation. So you, you, you could write it up like that, but mm -hmm. I definitely think you need to be as clear as you can in defining um, how you've observed and how you perceive the risk. Mm. Um, yeah. so. it's, uh, someone said here, so technically FI with every code. Well, the, 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 the thing is, Mark, is how much time you've got for engineering judgment. Yes. Um, if you can take the time to look at the manufacturer to then research the manufacturer to make sure if the manufacturer is happy for four times 2.5 mil cables to go in their socket, then you can tick that. If you don't, then that's the point. Do we ignore it or do we then put extra work? And I, I can completely understand that with regards to how rapid we have to do these these days, this kind of work just doesn't sound doable. And this is the thing, I, I was taught as well that um, you should always consider yourself standing in front of someone in a senior position, a judge, and you should be able to define and, and, and clearly explain. As the documents we were talking about earlier on state, we're, work, we're trying to work from 
guidance and regulations and all the rest of it, trying to provide a, a qualitative service, a good service where we can clearly understand and explain our understanding of what we've seen. And, and this is where a lot of the times we're seeing in EICRs, people row because they're not taking the time to understand the reasoning behind the observations. Um, but right, here we go. Another one. Um, this one, John? No. Nope. Well, John no. hasn't said anything, but I'm pretty no, sure no, these no. all come from John Maud. But uh, there you go. No. I'm obviously going bonkers because John sent me a folder. Did you put any of ones? Stuff. Yeah, did you put any of John's in this? Uh, I yeah, thought I'd put loads of John's in here. Yeah, most of the ones at the end are mine. So. Okay. Oh, are they? Oh, we'll, thank uh, God. We'll get to right, that. Um, <laughs> we'll get to this is it. another one sent on Instagram. The dreaded plumber strikes. Now, it's fairly evident that there is some form of scorching on those cables. Those junction boxes are not fixed. Um, it's a very difficult one because uh, I believe that was in the back of a cupboard. I spun, forgive me, I did spin the picture around 90 degrees because it didn't come out right in the vertical, so I wanted it to fill the screen, but forgive the head tilting. Yeah. Uh, but that was actually in the back of a boiler cupboard. Um, okay, so we've got issues with those, those cables have definitely been exposed to external influences that mm -hmm. potentially could have yeah, damaged is that them. Scorching or are they mouldy? Uh, I, I was thought it was scorching. Not, it's, it's, it's quite uniform over the whole length of the cable, so yeah, well, that's plumbers for you. Mm. You can, you know, actually, do you know what? You're all right. It could, you could, you could look at that as mold. Actually, I was told it was scorching, but yeah, you you could, you could suggest that could it's, be mold. It does seem very kind of, and it is in a boiler a boiler cupboard where it's going to be damp and all the rest of it. Um, I actually would again, I'd see through it. I think to honest with you, see through it um, with an FI. Yeah. Again, depends. If I was there all day, I'd be pulling that apart. Um, yeah. My my um with this kind of scenario, I always think about it's always important for us to understand why we do this work. So I think of things like Emma Shaw, etc., the scenario that creates yes. that. And then we have wiring in such proximity to pipe work. I doesn't mean I change my code, but I put, I will always make sure I've done a huge amount of investigation work to make sure there is no potential danger in that scenario. You know, you know it's very on, important on that alone on just mentioning the MSUR stuff you are right the risk of having electrical connections floating near to uh conductive pipe work um if there was a failure even of that crappy insulating tape mm. um to a single sheath conductor because always obviously damaged it you could to say say that is potentially dangerous urgent remedial action required but this is me be doing a drive-by now mm -hmm. so on my initial drive-by quick open the cupboard look at that it's a c3 more consideration yeah c2 but there's definitely there's definitely further investigation into that. This is the thing: a C three leaves that like that. Yes, you know, and it's it a case. It's a case of really um, if we're happy with that, and it would be again, it'd be down to I'd, I'd be really looking for evidence that a couple of guys have mentioned floating. Yeah. So is there risk of vibration? So is there free movement of the joint boxes? The joint boxes aren't fixed clearly. So if yeah. the utilization of this covered space. Yeah, maybe for clothing, whatever, would result in vibration that would result in mechanical movement. That's going to, over time, potentially create further danger. And I'd want that out. Do you know what? You're right. I, I, I yeah, I, I would probably yeah. agree with you here actually and go but see too. If it's if it's completely out of view and there's no risk of vibration movement or or that, then I might keep it C3. But I'm not going to try to make it a C2. But I need to really be confident in this kind of area because it's very important that we do our history. That we look at things like the Emma Shaw scenario, that we understand why it's important we take full respect to this work. And whenever anyone asks why we take so long or why we do it to such degree that we want to do it, those are the case studies we need to immediately just throw back at our clients to let them realize the importance of doing this properly because it was doing this work incompetently that killed her. Mm. You know? So, yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, again, FI for me, and I'd be in there like a hawk. Uh, and probably my FI might end up just moving it out of the way anyway. Yeah, know. you know, you'd, you probably would just yeah you'd remove them away from the pipe work, put them in some sort of fixed base connectors, and it does. Stuff. Yeah, there, there is this problem obviously where we have this wiring systems because we've got obviously this is like some kind of you've got the twin and earth there, and you've got are those flexes coming out or to the yeah. So it's it's part of the central heating wiring, I guess that is. Yes, so it's, it is. Yeah, ownership of responsibility there. Yeah, apparently it was in a it was in a boiler cupboard and there was a water tank sat above it and yeah, it was a complete mm. mess. Um but that was what I was told. Mm. Um I don't think there'd be clothing in it because there would be mouldy clothing. Um <laughs> I just think it's more of a 
I, I could only assume that would be maybe somewhere out on a farm, maybe, or something like that. Maybe. Remember, being um, domestic, you know, any any void space can easily be taken over to store product, to store chemicals, to store anything. Yeah. But there's definitely external influences on the cable. There's definitely damage to that cable because they've obviously mm -hmm. tried to tape it up to replicate an additional sheath and the connections aren't fixed. Um, yeah, and again... That, that... And there's no mechanical protection on that cable as well. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And again, remember, that do. tape, whilst it may be considered as additional sheath, 416 does say that insulation shall only be removed by destruction or with the use of a tool. So mm. we can't consider it to be insulation in the 416 insulation medium if they put tape around it. Yep. Yeah, and there you go. It... That just shows my, my own stupidity. If I'm doing a drive-by, I'll look at that, open up a door, look at that, and go, oh, yeah, C3 requires improvement, close the door again. I spend five minutes thinking about it, and it's, it's a C2. Mm. Engineering judgment, assessment, and understanding of risk. Um, right, okay. Did everyone get that? Or yeah, we've got we do a C2s, and C3s and C3s there. Oh, yes. Fantastic. Okay. So. Hopefully, um, hopefully everybody realised that it's a big, good balance of risk yeah. we're trying to address in holy cow. <laughs> the biggest issue with me, for me with this is time. We get, we just don't get enough time to do the just to do the work justice, unfortunately. No, and this is why I I would never want to. If I was doing domestic, I would rarely want to do more than one a day unless I was in a flat and right. i have done them in the voids where there's four circuits and i could do i said one i said this in our podcast you know for things like a small a small house i you know unless it's a small bed one bed one or two bedroom or a flat I, otherwise i want my day's money so i haven't got to rush to another job then i can keep my you know my work you know my, my work there what is this it's a mess <laughs> it's another loft special isn't it really yeah. it's not one of mine but um oh, okay. i would put c2 on that because there's, there's all those connectors just exposed, uh, so C2 is a minimum, and there's no way you're going to get the lid on. Although the cables are quite nicely uh, clipped, clipped. On the sides, you um, know. What I mean, but clearly someone's put effort wrong. into that, but then yeah. realised when they were doing it that there was no way. This is the beauty of Wagos. Wagos <laughs> could fix that mess. Um, I believe it's some sort of central heating cluster mess. Um, I've done a house where we've had three boilers seven cylinder stats, eight thermostats, a number of valves. It was a listed building. All the central heating wiring mm. rooms had to go in the loft. You ended up with a, a big piece of plywood on the wall. You get all your cables up, and then you've got to try and figure out, you know, how it all works. And if you've got a priority and uh, changeover switch for the boilers, pump overruns. So this is the sort of mess you can get with the old wiring schemes. And somebody's obviously got to the point where they've done the follow the live game using connector blocks. And then said, "Sod the CPCs. I'll connect them later." Um, for me, I would I would actually see one that, and the reason being, that? it's in it's in the loft. In the um, loft, there are uh, there are life parts that potentially a smaller person could go in and touch and could come loose. Mm -hmm. um, so that's going to make you life. need to. I that's I, that's going to make you need to remove that danger, ideally. So what are you going to do? Just turn it off. Um. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I would turn around and say that needs to stay off until that gets fixed. Yeah. And I guarantee you the homeowner would probably say, "Can you please fix it?" And you'd be like, "Great, five six hours in a <laughs> in a loft for my sins, and get a Sorel. I'd get a Sorel box, something decent size, with a din rail or or some sort. Because of, I don't think a Wago box will fix that. You need something of a chunky size that mm -hmm. you're going to have to mm -hmm. make. Um, but again, I would I agree with John. I, I'm not going to disagree with John. C2 as a starter. But then applying a factor of risk and utilization of the installation and the variable what if, who am I using my um, assessment of risk trying to protect yep. in my coding? Is there a family with a small child? Um, you know, do people go in the loft? I know when I was a child, my old man used to sling me and my brothers up in the loft because we were light and skinny and can just get thrown up and then just drop out and be caught to go and get stuff. So uh, I'm pretty much on that. Stuff. I'm pretty much in a ballpark. It's the C2 to me as I look at it at first. And then yeah. it's a case of, right, is there any other information that takes this to C1? You know, is it likely that people are going to be, you know, walking or crawling past it when they go into the love space? Is there evidence of scorching or evidence of heating? Is there other things that kind of push it into uh, C1? Great comment from Mark Dole. Couldn't get a cover on that if God himself tried. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's it's a mess. It's an art, and the thing is, somebody's put the effort in. You can see. I think two people plywood. have done that. I think one person's done the cable clipping and cable running, and another guy who don't clearly 
don't give a toss. Yeah, but I was just is. getting the ump on a Friday afternoon. Yeah. <coughs> just finish. turned around and had them all labelled up and was like, right, let's just get this all wired in. Mm. Um, it's a shame. But there you go. Right, okay. Uh, I had the poll on that one. We had, <clears throat> yeah, split C1, C2s. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. And that's the beauty of it, because I can agree with both those coding scenarios. Yeah, and um, that's important. The, We're not here to say it's C2, you're wrong. It's C1, yes, you're wrong. We're here to say that. We're not that, here yeah. to say that. But what yeah. we are here to, uh, to try and introduce you to is, is maybe some new guidance in the document that is risk and Especially. maybe uh, a different way of working and, and uh, giving you more tools to think and consider how we're identifying risk and also communicating that to your customers as well. But yeah, no, that's cracking. That's a really good one. Right, let's move on. Moving on. Well, this is one of mine. Hey! Glad to know. So we <laughs> actually got to them. Um, right. This did have a cover on it originally, and it did have fuses in it as well. So it's, it's, that's obviously been taken out. Um, the thing to look at here is the fact that these are rewirable fuses, 3036. Yes. And also look at what conductors are attached to each of the fuses in there and relevant to the values of those fuses. It looks lovely and clean, though, doesn't it? Yeah. John, do you hoover them out? <laughs> that looks very clean. Um, All right, so what rating fuses have we got here? Right, well, if we have on the left, we've got the blue one, which will be 15 amps. Yep. The red one is 30. And then the two yellow ones, which are fairly uncommon, are 20. Mm. Is it me, or am I going blind, or are all them conductors pretty much the same size? The, they're all the same, apart from the yellow one in the middle. So it looks slightly thicker. Yeah. She's a bit bigger. Well, it's the, it's the, it's the argument of the... And that's one of the biggest things for an inspector as well we didn't even mention is the thickness of insulation curse. Whereas that's, it's become harder you now. You used to be able to feel a conductor go, it's that. Nowadays, you don't, I mean, no. Well, the, the debate between 1 mil, 1 5 has just got worse now because of the multiple strands of manufacturers mm. and the thickness of insulation causes a problem. Um, mm. But yeah, okay. This actually supplied some storage heaters. Ah, it's an off-peak storage yeah. heater board. Yeah. Right. So do we have any problems with 3036? Are you asking me? Hopefully not. I'm asking, <laughs> asking people. Yeah. Yes, that's the right kind of route to go. Yeah. yeah. I like the old school stuff. Mm. I'm sorry, but I do Okay, find, so I Chris has mentioned here, um, K rating on them are only one, so if PFC is higher than C2, so we need to obviously... Good one, Chris. What's the prospective fault current? Because obviously the KA rating of 3036s is fairly non-existent. So if we assume the PFC is nice and low... Yeah, I think it was. It was a flat, and it was it was probably TNCS, so it's going to be really low. So, all right, that is a good point. Actually, they've made. Where's the CPCs for all of them? Because there's only one I could see, other than the the main CPC for the board, and then I can only see one CPC connected for all four circuits. I think it goes to that cable coming out to the right. Where are the circuits going anyway? They're going into that enclosure to the left, so the CPC is probably in there with them. Yeah, this is the one to the left. Is one? It was one of those three-way split Wilex things with the the off-peak and the hot water and the normal circuits all in the same box. Mm. Is that where the CPCs were for the? Probably. Okay. Because they all come from that enclosure there. So. Mm. And it says there's plenty of copper visible on the tails. I mean, the manufacturers put this insulation on there to insulate. So is that kind of going against the grain of what the manufacturer wants? Where we still have exposed copper above there. Can we also chuck into the debate about um, the guidance on identification of conductors within boards and the, the now requirement to have both uh, sheaths uh, all the way up to the uh, terminal themselves? Years ago, was that in the rigs or the guidance notes? Mm. Remember where where these were selected and erected on previous editions where it may have been compliant. Um, but we are inspecting to current rigs. Um, but it's all, all good debates to have within the brain. You know, Chris Ruddock's put there, fixed load, no risk of overload, which is correct for that 30 amp one, the red one, because these they had one storage heater on each. So although that is a single conductor, and it's a 30 amp fuse, which is obviously not correct in terms of overload, a storage heater isn't going to overload that single conductor. So mm. that's an interesting one. So what do we think? 
Let's wait for the guys on the poll. Uh, Dave's brought in four three three dot three to one. I guess that's uh, that's over. That's overload protection, David. Am I correct? Four three four is full current. Four three three is overload. Yes, good. It's been a while. Uh, yeah, four three three dot one. Uh, yeah, uh, John, you're right. Um, I remember. I remember having to kind of contact a couple of companies that are doing training material, and they'd always use a three zero three six device because it uses that CF factor. But then it'd use resistive heaters as the load mm. and you don't have to have overload protection if the load is not going to overload. Yeah. Okay. It's so clean though. I keep looking at it. It's really, yeah. yeah it's, it's still, it looks like it was installed only a few months ago. Um, I'm going right. to, I'm going to, I'm going to see to that. You'll see to it. Why are you see to me? Age of installation, um, CPCs, uh, exposed copper, the, the, it's a it's a cumulative narrative i think with this i would suggest that the board is life expired and may not provide sufficient protection for the installation in the event of a single and tragic failure um mm -hmm. yeah John, are the are the um he, are the, is the equipment on this modern or is it old it's it was pretty well it, it was I think it was 1970s stuff and what someone's put this thing in the 1980s as some kind of replacement for what was in the one to the left of it. Mm -hmm. It was all ripped out and replaced uh, in the end. Mm -hmm. The other thing here is these 20 amp rewilder fuses, um, because of that correction factor of that 0 0.725, mm -hmm. you can't have 2.5 millimeter cable on a 20 amp rewilder fuse, but you can on a 20 amp circuit breaker. Okay. Now in this particular case, it's a fixed load. So, not necessarily a huge issue, but uh, it's another thing to consider. No wonder they sold so many retrofit breakers. Mm. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> right. What does the What does the survey say? It's a quite a mixed one on this one. This is good. Uh, this is a good one. All right. This right. is a good one to want to show you. No, oh, the majority C two, mm. C three, FI. Yeah, John, I could spend an hour talking about this one yeah. actually. Um, I want to know a couple of things. I want to know the perspective for current. Yeah, I want to know obviously the users to see if the ends will end up using, you know, if one day the heaters will be ripped out and maybe they'll put sockets. I just, as you say, you, you're saying about life expired. I want to know about the future because the idea of these is obviously we're going to inspect for the future. So I just want to know the use. If they are just simple heater systems that don't overload, there's little to no signs of thermal stresses. It, one other thing, it, five two six. Connection yeah. and conductors, you look at the tails there, if that's underneath the stairs and I hang my clothes on it or a jacket or something stupid or somebody goes in and pulls it, there's no clamp there. So all that's going to do is just increase the bending radius. You're on about the cable coming down without the tails. Yeah, 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 the main tails. Mm. Which and I'm obviously... seriously worried about the one CPC there, to be honest with you, because that's just weird. Mm. That, yeah, the one is from that white cable to the right. To the right. And the other three are from the... They're in the board on the They're left. In the board on the left, yeah. Ah, oh, right, gotcha, sorry. Apologies. Yeah. So, yeah, they've looped through there. Okay, yeah. gotcha. They do exist. They're just not in the place they should be. So. Oh, great. Hey, cool. That's a, that's a nice one. Though. That's a good one, that one. Right, let's move on. All right, this one, um, all we're looking at here is the pipe in the relation pipe. to the consumer unit because we'll actually see this consumer unit in a later picture when it's with the cover off. So mm. it's just the pipe on this one. Okay, what are we saying about the pipe then, John? Well, the pipe is in such a position that you can't actually get the cover of the consumer unit off without sort of trying to bend it around the back of the pipe and all that. So, yeah, never a good thing. It's a bit of a weird angle. You, it is possible to get the cover off, but you've literally got to undo the two little screws and then mm. sort of try and shift it around in various different directions. And eventually you can get it in a position where it just about comes out of there. Okay, so it's okay. Sort of accessibility of uh, equipment. So, yeah. Shall I throw some controversy in this? Yes, Go on then. Let's throw some controversy. So, I've got the Codebreaker book out, which defines this as a non codable observation. Um, I'll read it out. Um, proximity of gas services to electrical wiring is not strictly 7671 issue. Regulation 5283 goes some way to cover this. Regulation 528.3 defines this as a proximity to services that produce heat, smoke, or fumes, which are likely to be detrimental to the wiring. I wouldn't say it's detrimental. I'd say you just can't get the cover off. Um, when located beneath mm. the gas service where it's caused condensation, in this case, 7671 only states precaution shall be taken. There is no mention of distances that gas and electrical services should be in 7671. However, 
Um, minimum distances of segregation are given in table 6.2 of BS 6891, 2015. Um, and it says minimum segregation between gas and electrical intakes is 150 mil and minimum segregation between gas service pipes and electrical accessories, switch gear or wiring as 25 mil. This is all guidance for them, not guidance for us. Is that right? Yes. This is guidance for the, the gas fitters and the plumbers. So where's the guidance for us? Probably buried in a guidance note that's littered with mistakes. Oops. <laughs> Did I say that loud? Sorry. Okay, I'm just I'm just looking for something you can talk. About. What else have we okay. got on here, John? Then we got so we got two, two main switches. Oh, it's a BG board. Oh God. Yeah, there is a problem with what's in the board. Let's say we'll see that in a later picture. Okay. So uh, we'll. Well, uh, on initial initial one, I'm going to throw it as a. Yeah. Oof. My brain tells me C3, but I want to go C2. Yeah, I think I put C3 on this because it's not. There's no actual danger there. It's just the inconvenience of not being able to get the cover off properly and obviously yep. pipes in proximity to uh, other parts. Yep. So, agree. Totally agree. I would I would sit down square in front of that enclosure and I would look at the impact the pipe makes for me to safely work on that panel. And if working on that panel is compromised by the presence of that pipe, I would consider an impact with regards to maintainability, accessibility, and I'd probably use electricity work regulation 15 to say that it's not as safe as it could be to work on. Yep. Okay, so what does the what does the survey say? Survey's going C3. Let me just Yeah, show like, look at this. I mean, you know, the labeling could do with some work. Yeah, um, there's I'm always has uh, yeah. there, so yeah. I'd I'd see I'd see C C3 it just for being a BG board to be honest with you. <laughs> just, just, say for that. just for the make. Just for the make. I've had too much C1. general stuff fail on me. I have spent too much of my own personal and private money yeah. on BG stuff for it to just fail miserably. Well, both 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 Chris and Mark have said C1 for using a BG board. Yeah. <gasps> screw fix so. special, isn't it? So. It's a screw fix special, yeah. Just like the old GE electric ones that screw fix used to knock out. Um, yeah. Right, okay. The, the front cover's on. not there because it's obviously coming off. Right, this one is a fuse, obviously. It's a rewirable fuse, and this is how it was taken out. And there's some bits missing from this. There is. is why the wire has been sort of just twisted round in that fashion, because there should be to screw at each end that the wire mm. actually goes it, round. Is that a staple? Is that um, a paper clip? It is actually fuse wire. It's probably oh. the wrong size. I was going to so, say, it, it looks almost like someone's um, managed to um, bodge a paper clip round the, it. Yeah. But... The fixing screws, the one on the left is just missing, and the one on the right has actually sheared off. It's sheared off. So well, it looks like there's some scorching there. Uh, yeah, a little bolt of the molten off, copper on the bottom edge there. Our favourite one, the old asbestos yep. pad. So, yeah. Mm. Okay. It's definitely C2, without a doubt, as a minimum. Um, and to be perfectly frank, I would, yeah, definitely C2 as a minimum um, in a house. Um, I would probably put a danger say, in, our, in, in, this. in a home with obviously asbestos present. I mean, if you're going to have that though. I, I mean, I've got asbestos on my shed. Yeah, yeah, Every, yeah. But you know, uh, this switch gear, this switch gear is obviously. Remember, these devices are designed to be ordinary person utilization. You, you know, replacing. Yeah, yeah. So you've got to think here about the safety of the homeowner actually replacing these fuses. Indeed. So there's a, you know, I think you this wanna, is why you people elevate have... your level of risk there. But this is why we went away from fuse wire, isn't it, to reset yeah. or trip switches to protect the ordinary person who was probably doing themselves harm with replacing yeah. the wire with the wrong thickness. Yeah. But again, I mean, 3036 is still fine. So rewirable fuse wires themselves are still acceptable. But this particular one, you know, where you have, you know, homeowners exposed to asbestos every time <clears> their fuse pops. You could probably just <clears throat> add a little bit level of risk on that. For me, okay. So. Let's un let's unveil it. Come on. What what does what has everyone said? Uh, they're pretty much in between C two and C one here. Yeah. Yeah. I, my initial thought is C two as well. Um, again, depending on a number of external factors and use factors and the overall condition of the board that I've took it from, um, it would pop very probably creep up to a C one because an installation that age. I'm sure you'll probably find 
quite a lot wrong. Um, yeah, there's probably many more codes to go with this board. Yeah. I would, oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'd but start this is at, more of an educational slide, yeah. this one, I think. As, I, good as I said earlier, I start at C2, then I look at the elevated levels of risk or even lowering levels of risk to see if I move that code. So this one, I'd start at C2, but if there's evidence that it's been regularly replaced, that the homeowners are regularly gaining access to asbestos, I might just add some of that utilization with the, with the presence of asbestos to see one. Yep, totally agree. Depending on how often they do that. If they never go in there at all, then it's probably going to stay a C2. Hey, Dave, next one. Now, this uh, is a common site. Yeah, this uh, is a Wilex uh, rewirable fuse box thing. Several things wrong with this. Mm. Most obvious being, of course, on the left side there, yep. those big chunks of brass. I'm going to assume this is readily accessible, yeah? Yep, it is. Okie dokie, this is shared. Be, uh, and you can just walk in there, and there it is, it's on the wall, about sort of eye level. So uh, that's one. C1. Thing. And yep, C1. C1. That, along the bottom edge there, that's a spy It's got to be live, isn't it? And the other thing that's wrong here is if you look at those three fuses, they're not actually in line. And the reason they're not in line is because the plastic shields are actually missing from all four of these all four of them, positions. Right? So if you take another fuse out, you're going to get the same situation again. Yeah, so, a mess. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd see one that. Definitely. See one there. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. stop the poll because, um, yeah, this, this, is one those, one there, yeah. this is this is this is one of those guarantees. <laughs> yeah, 100%, Look at yes. that. <laughs> hey, bingo, JW, 100%. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Right, moving on. Not what we're saying. So this was this was sent to me the other day. Um, we've got loads and loads of pictures. We could do a, a webinar just on insulation affecting consumer units. Now, I've never, ever, ever seen this in a consumer unit where it's fairly evident somebody has pumped uh, foam insulation from one side and it's filled the board. And they're them GE specials. These are screw, screw fix specials, these are. Uh, okay, I, I remember one of the early boards that I used to fit quite regularly in houses was these GE boards when they first brought out their split load RCD variation. They even did a single RCD, non RCD variation in the 16th edition. Um, but they were pretty sturdy. They were good balance of quality and cost. Uh, how, Jesus, look at the state of that. I mean, where, do you, where do you start with that one? Um, you can see where it's expanded into it and the cover's been taken off by the inspector. But where do you begin with that? You, well, what can you do other than say this needs to be... It's a nightmare. This, I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh... it's an utter, utter nightmare. So, um, yeah, I know what the actual... It doesn't stop expanding. Right. Ghostbusters comes to Keeps mind. Keeps going. Yeah, yeah, Vigo. <laughs> so does this have any, does this, does this material have any thermal impact to the cables? Of course it does. Yep. Yeah. So there's going to be a reassessment There are more and more places impact. banning this PE foam as well, mm. this, this expandable foam, because you can buy it in a can and it says, oh, fire rated, but they won't define fire rating. Um, and, and there's all sorts of yeah. different fire resistant um, and all, it's, do you want to show you? I, I, I saw a job the other day where the person was using some pink foam filler that was fire rated. So I took a piece of it and I went outside into the car park and I set fire to it. Yeah. yeah. Nah, sorry. Gives off black smoke. Yeah. Nah. Yeah, I might be. Uh, there's a place I'm going to tomorrow, actually. It's got a load of this in the riser. So I might just steal a bit and see if it. Uh... Take Ooh, it. Okay. So be, put, be... put a flame to it for about 30 to 60 mm -hmm. seconds and just watch the black smoke come out. Um, It'd be interesting if you can take a sample and run a cable through it and put it under load and then see the temperature variation where it runs through this material. Don't give him any more ideas for videos. Yeah. He's got thousands to do. Yeah, yeah, we have too many already. So. Just, <laughs> just to see what the, ther the thermal impact is on this. Okay, so we know this. So are we, are we at C2 here? Yeah, I'm C2 yeah. all day. I'm C2 and a recommended board change because I am not spending hours picking that all off. I'm unscrewing that from the wall, stripping it all back. Start again. Um, and just clearing the space for the cables and investigating further. And the other yeah. thing, you've got no RCDs there whatsoever, so it's obviously yep. a fairly old installation, so mm -hmm. there's going to be other things that doesn't comply. So That's late 90s, that is. Yeah. I remember them boards well. They were very popular in screw fix. There we go. Okay, 70% C2. Okay, so we've got... And GE did boards. Yeah. Got seventy percent C two on this, eighteen percent C one. Uh, maybe the the fire risk is also in 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 you know affecting. Does the that. foam affect the MCB operation? I think the thermal performance of the cabling and the board would be brought into question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okie dokie. 
Uh, right. Um, that yeah, I'm I'm just going to say this for Sean, but the, when I see that sort of thing, it does bore my piss. There you go, Sean. <laughs> I said it. Um, right. Here's a nice, quick, simple one. Wonderful weatherproof sockets that we find everywhere, um, with a very simple visual inspection observation because we inspect before we test. Um, yep. What do we think? I quite like that socket because it's yeah. a changeable one. It's, it's BG, by the way. Is it? I hate yeah. it. <laughs> I hate it immediately. And I'll give you a million reasons why. <laughs> it's just, well, the insulation yeah. resistance with the LEDs in series is a pain in ride. No, I'll shut up anyway. Yeah, this is okay, so... pocket. Um, it was on the outside wall exposed to rain and the uh, cover was open when I uh, found it. So, What did okay. you code it? Oh, what, did, what does everyone else think? Yeah, I think everybody's going C3. Sean's being over the top as usual, drama queen, C2ing it. <laughs> Sorry, well, obviously John. in this case you've got to I mean John just said the cover was up so we've got to then say well is that adequate eye protection if the cover is always up do you know what you know, um, can I is... can I can I see to it just for the neons because the neons were a great idea years ago so that people could have a visual confirmation that this power supply to that equipment was live mm -hmm. um, but they're they're a nightmare when doing testing and they always fail anyway and then mm -hmm. they just make the accessory look rubbish so yeah. I, I, yeah, it's to me it's a C3, but I'd probably see to it now because it's BG and neons. And the neons are pointless because when the cover's closed, you can't see them anyway. So oh, did I, you see what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, RPG. so the lid was up. So the IP rating is obviously an issue that needs coding. And obviously, was there evidence of the cause of this? Was it just an impact? There was. Use? There was an extension lead plugged into this. But there was nothing plugged into the extension lead, and the extension lead was trailing outside on some decking, and that actually was full of water, which obviously showed up as a fault. Wow. When it was unplugged, the insulation resistance showed perfectly fine, bar the uh, neons, obviously. Mm. So, so uh, it is a good point. Um, Mark Holmes um, has basically said, oh, hang on, it's disappeared now. Um, yeah. If C3, nothing would be done for five years. And there's some great comments from Daniel. Uh, outside, liable to temperature rise, fluctuations, condensation, um, and that could make that worse. Yes. It's a good point. So I think said, about I, the external influences. This is what I said about 20 minutes ago. This is about testing for continued use, mm. isn't it? So we've got to think about this being used in the future. So you've got a lid that's not being shut. You've got moisture ingress. And a precedence where you found it where it's not been shut, so you know that the users of the installation are not using it as it's intended by manufacturer. Mm -hmm. So um, See, I've got I've got these um, I've got these ones. They've got this spring, so you lift it and they go. Yeah, right. I've got, yeah, in my garden because I've got um, you know kids and stuff. So if they lift the flap, the flap goes down. The flap doesn't rest upward. So there's so, another design flaw for BG. So looks these like it's a have C2. a spring. Yeah, these have got a spring in it. So if you open it to that position, the spring it's... actually holds it open. Oh, oh brilliant! <laughs> and then when you close it, it does hold it shut, but it snaps it's got it. Those yeah. two positions, yeah. Oh. yeah. Not a particularly. Good so the utilization but... here, the users are clearly not using it properly as instructed. Yeah. Okay. So what are we what are we looking at then, as far as the pole? Nearly there, folks. Ah. C three to C two again. We have a good balance of C two. I can see the C3, but with the user consideration and the environment, I may be in C2 territory. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of agreeing with Mark, actually, because he's, he's bang on right. If you have a cracked or damaged socket, a crack or damaged socket could easily be a C1. Mm. Um, and just because it's a slim crack doesn't mean it won't become a worse one. Yeah. Uh, and the in-between between C3 and 1, yeah. So, yeah, no, I, I'm actually going to completely agree with you, um, Mark, and go C2. Again, good, good assessment of risk there. Good, good engineering judgment. So yeah, I, I agree with that. But um, good, right? What's next. Oh, Jesus! All right, this is a combination uh, boiler, and that's the uh, wiring for it. Nicely wrapped up in some insulation tape with white emulsion slapped on. Right. Well, let's go home then. So jobs are good, and there in it yeah, for the yeah. gas safe registered regulated industry. God, that's a mess, isn't it? I hate push fit. Can yeah. I see one just the push fit alone? But before before we start talking about this, I mean, scope wise, a lot many people might exclude this from their inspection because it's not part of the fixed so where do you sit with that uh, essentially you wiring is part of a fixed installation without a doubt i've always had that i've always done i used to do central heating wiring for british gas it's it forms part of the fixed installation it's just the controls part 
there is a bigger issue here which we need to do a webinar on on the whole gas fitters doing electrics and and all the rest but of that's the cable going on. into the boiler so that's yeah so that a, will be a that will be a, a an equipment accessory that's a cable for yeah there's two cables one is the power for the boiler and the other one yes. is the thermostat connection mm. yeah i i've always treated that as part of the fixed wiring i don't treat that as an accessory i fix wiring right, who in the chat the... always tests 100 percent of the central heating system when they do an eicr so I'll, okay I'll, I'll ask another question <laughs> if you ask the iet if you ask the iet um is it if it runs on mains voltage does it fall under electricity at work regulations they will say yes does it fall under bs7671 they will say yes because we've asked that question already and we're still waiting on gas safe to give us some sort of common sense answer which at the moment they can't because they've fix bayonets and put the barriers up um do you test um would you include hvac on an eicr yes and and that and somebody hopefully uh, would then go oh you've used sy really badly and i'd say rip it out because i can't stand sy because it's never installed correctly uh, never mind glanded or anything else but and i found tons of rusted sy i should have i think i'll put one in the industrial commercial one of sy where it's just completely broken down and corroded um but so yes. you know, most people are saying no they don't okay that's fair mm -hmm. enough if that's mm -hmm. what they do but um again it's if you're making a declaration that the entire fixed electrical installation is safe well, the problem is people don't know what the installation is within the scope because they're not told because so three doesn't cover it the in service inspection testing of electrical equipment embraces it into their system so there's confusion really yes mm -hmm. so they've put it in the pat testing code of practice even it's though it's equipment. part of buried into the fabric it's equipment and it says in there, in the code of practice, it says if the equipment is in the building fabric, then you may have to elevate that into this work, but only if it's within the building fabric. But well, the equipment the itself... in wiring is in the building fabric. It's buried no, in the well, you go into a boiler. And... No, you, you're talking about just the stack cable to the yeah. boiler. When you go into a boiler cupboard with all these other cables going to the three-bolt yeah. valves and all this stuff... So we don't look for strain, unnecessary strain placed upon terminations, even though it's mains voltage and the relevant safety access, accessible joints it's all pat testing stuff i've evidently missed something because pat testing has always been a low level priority for me in that respect um and i'll be honest with that but for me i used you'll to find that the current and you'll, and, you'll find that the training and everything will say you go to the fixed point of utilization which will be the fuse so connection unit i have asked i have asked gas safe and the iet about this uh, whether minor work certificates should be issued on central heating wiring and i've got it in writing from both of them that it should be Mm. It's a minor works. It's under 7671 scope. That's from the head of the wiring rigs committee themselves. We definitely need to do a webinar probably next year because we'll be busy that covers and explores this a bit more. But for me, that's a C2 just based on the fact that terminations are rubbish and that could be accessed by an unskilled person or a child. It's too much of a risk. Yeah, this was in a kitchen and the boiler oh, was yeah. mounted above a worktop. So about Mm -hmm. inches below that is the worktop and there was no cover over the pipes or anything so that was just right in the kitchen clearly on display so and david bearich has made a brilliant comment at 65 quid a test no chance i am not i am not getting involved yet with that 65 quid 80 pound drive buys that extent and imitations that one day some will sit in front of a judge on um what's the pit what have everybody else said sorry on the the have you have you put the did I launch the poll for this one? I, I don't, don't know. remember if I did or not. If not, don't worry. Just all yeah, right. we'll move on. I've got, yeah, I've got C3s. On. Okay. okay this I is, see to it, but yeah. Yeah, there's, these are two separate installations. Uh, this is about bonding, and these are the water supplies that come in. And the thing here is, what are we actually connecting to, and what are we actually bonding? So look carefully at the uh, pipes, and also uh, what's above and below where the... I love that one on the right. That's great. Yeah, great. That's why I put them together because I thought they were both great examples of uh, insulated inserts. <clears throat> so the one on the right, we've got a uh, the blue pipe the MDP or plastic coming in there. That's mm -hmm. the main stop tap. A bit of copper, and then we've got a white plastic push fit, which goes to the rest of the system. And you can see there's another grey one in the back there. And then the one on the left, that's a white plastic pipe coming in. And then the thing above it is one of these things that claims to stop lime scale. All right. Um, it is a metal bodied item, but if you look at the bottom of it, it's got a black plastic push fit connection. So, again, what are we actually bonding to? Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> funding's present, but does it need to be present? And if it does need to be present, is this really the right place to be connecting it? Okay, the so... One, the left one, the, the plumbing pipes in the rest of that building were all copper on that left one. All right, so the left one has branch metal pipe work throughout. Yes. Okay. The other so one was all plastic. All plastic. Or mostly plastic. There was a so is of... there a difference in risk in those two different scenarios? Mm. What do we think? You know, um, I'll go in the poll because this is quite an interesting one, this one. I've got a very controversial view on this. Go for it. Um, based on what I know, uh, and you know what I'm talking about, I genuinely believe that we will end up going back to EBADOS um, rather than EBAD. Mm -hmm. or ads sorry we'll be going back to ebados um and that the only reason i say that is because at the moment we're looking at a lot of earthing issues with the dnos and um diverted neutral current issues and i think one of the only ways to protect an installation is to apply the method of ebados i think it's also of the same potential i think it's also one of the easiest i think it's also one of the easiest ways to just get everyone to understand <clears> it the same way it wasn't so frustrating when we or confusing when we had EBAD, ebados yeah. You know? Since they started to question the need for it, people started to kind of tiptoe around it or just get confused with it. All right, so we've got um forty one percent FI for this one. So oh, it's, it's, a, it's not a bad shout. It's not and, a bad shout. And a couple of people will be commenting, I know, because I mean I know who's in this room that they'll be saying, Well, you know, it could go under the ground in you know, later on, some of the pipe work. So it could, you know, the metal pipe work that John's described for the left installation may go under the ground. Yeah, Perfect place. Put, uh, test required to see where bonding may be required, but not where they've done it. So FI, yeah, because that's certainly that one on the left where it's metal for most of the rest of the property. Yeah, you can't assume that it's actually just connected through that bit of plastic because it could go into other parts of the building or under the floor or who knows what. So, Well, I think there was a good picture put on social media a while ago. Um, I can't remember by who, where they had a plastic MDP gas main, but it went into a gas box, but the box was half buried in the ground. The gas pipe then went out of the box into the ground through the wall under the ground and then back up into the house all in copper so that yeah. straight away you think well bond it but I, I do think um i think in in the near future i mean we'll, we'll do it again we'll do a separate webinar on this but we're looking at diverted neutral current phenomena we're looking at a number of issues with network stability network configuration and i i think it's fairly evident to say based mm. on the research that we have been doing the networks was, are a bit of a mess. We need to untangle this web so that we can present it to you guys. Mm. But I do think um, I've always believed that bonding, regardless whether you have an insulated insert, I would just do it. Although whoever put that cable on that uh, right hand side one needs to use a crimp lug because I hate seeing that because anyone could, any unskilled person could just pull that out. Mm. So, so, I, you've just mentioned diverted neutral currents. So I'll yes. just mention it. Earlier on, we had the gas pipe in front of the panel. I thought about diverted neutral currents, you know, where we had that proximity yeah. to the board with that yeah. gas pipe. But yeah. yeah. All right, um, cool. Yeah, I think there's definitely one thing. We'll, we'll, we'll cover it in another webinar. Yeah. Next one. Right, this is uh, a cable with a thing on the end of it. This was in a bathroom. This is under the basin in the cupboard that's directly under the basin. And what right. we've got there is it was connected and it was live. This is mains power? Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. Volts. It's very common that. I've seen that in lots of places where an old maybe an old macerator might be disconnected. Mm -hmm. Strip it mm -hmm. back, connect a block it, the plumber does it. Pff, away you go. Puts a new trap on. Yeah. Um, I've seen it a few times where a supply's been put in there for a macerator. There's a change in design. The cable's just left there. It's, no. Yeah, it's, it's too dangerous, though. But what yeah, happens is they do home. that. They do that to test it, but then they leave it because obviously the other trade hasn't put in the system and it gets yeah. left. Yeah. You know, it's been stripped and terminated for testing. Looking at that, you can see the CPCs there for the R1, R2 testing, but it's just been left there abandoned or just, there's a used. valuable bit of guidance there though, isn't it? For the person signing off that certificate, make sure whatever you do, because I've seen this before and we've all mm. heard stories of this when you are signing off that installation is complete, make sure it is complete. And there's Incomplete. not a few variations that the builders waiting that you're doing on trust because uh, these sorts of yeah. things happen and i've always every story i've heard around these sorts of cables is oh well the builder said he'd come back or the electrician said he'd come back there's a certificate yeah he sent on email he forgot about it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so where are we with this i mean c2 c1 i'm gonna go c1 just because it's under a cupboard and a small child could open it yeah uh, yeah just grab onto it 
I would, I would often think C2 Next due to the reduced size, but ready accessible under a cupboard where yep. children may go elevates that to C1 oh. for me. And in a bathroom as well. In so. a bathroom. Yeah. Yeah, yeah C1, yeah. I think that's fairly... Uh... Sean has said just needs enclosing appropriately. Absolutely right, Sean, it does. Mm. But we're not there to enclose it appropriately. We are there just to code it. This is just, but I, I don't disagree with you, Sean, in any way, shape or form. Um, a decent IP rated Wago box stuffing gland absolutely solves a problem. Yeah, you know, probably 10, 15 minute job. But in my, opinion, a decent, doing coding. in my opinion, a decent inspector does that for clients as well. Helps get yes. rid of the problems. But obviously there are many inspectors, call them inspectors. But well, a, a, good, a the good inspector quote. will always, always try and again, do the morally right thing we we'll try and remove C1s where it's reasonably practicable because you'll have that judge asking, what did you do? And if you turn around yes. and say it wasn't in my scope, yet it was a two pound. What action did you take? Yeah. You know, we see a lot of people go, Oh, I mean, they saw it the other day on the webinar. I'll oh, write a danger notification. Yeah. yeah I mean, you, you can do great. that as a record, but, but that I mean, is it. That's more covering you than protecting them. Yeah. I, know, I, I'm going to one... confess now because they can't sack me for it. But a company I worked for, I used to go into installations to do wiring on central heating systems. And if there was no earthing and bonding, I would install the bonding. But the company wanted, uh, I think it was like £400 minimum. Um, and I, if the customer didn't have that money, um, I would do it anyway. Because I knew the impact of not having it in place. Um, by the way, just for anyone realises that company was a large multinational company or a shower anyway. So I had no problem in doing it. And I, for me, it was more about actually protecting the families that yeah. I was doing the wiring in rather than the big multi-corporate organisation who wanted to... A lot of houses, you'd have the water, especially where I was in Essex, you'd have the electrical installation, the gas and the water main in the same cupboard. Mm -hmm, so it was mm -hmm. just a loop of cable and they wanted £400 for it. Yeah. No. <laughs> fix it. I don't want to go in, into the dock for that. Right, this one, um, several things here. The main thing is look at the 32 amp Classic. circuit breaker and what's attached to it. And also look at the tails coming in or what's left of them at least. Uh, yeah, this is uh, not This is not healthy. Jesus. So yeah, that 32 amp one in the uh, third one from the left. What load was on that? Wow. That was um, I can't remember actually. I think it was a socket in a kitchen. Yeah, that's um, yeah, classic yeah. MEM three eight seven one board. Um, what we got? We got VIR there. We've got connectors on the CPCs. Um, I don't know why they. Well, they probably just couldn't extend over to the earth bar. Um, it just looks like there's been poor alterations and additions there. Whether that that's, VR even has a CPC. That's in fact, you on can the see on the neutral, up. Dave. You yeah. can see, if you just look where the twin and earth is, the red, yellow, and blue, the three core they've used, you can see there's exposed strands of that mm. VIR. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I'm I'm most certainly, yeah, all right. It's within an enclosure. The enclosure was on, I'm assuming. Strain placed on the terminal. As a minimum, it's a C2. As a minimum. It's a C2, and then I look at things like the strain on that incoming main. Oh, yeah. You know, what protection's on that? Is it a 60 amp service fuse or something? Uh, this mess was supplied from another consumer unit. In the oh, right. Oh, great. Daisy chaining. Oh, yes. Yeah. What he do? This was an old one, and then some person put a new one in the kitchen, which was also a total disaster. I think we're going to see some examples of that on our commercial industrial ones, where people yeah, yeah. run boards off of boards off of boards, then wonder why they don't get the necessary fault current values to drip, trip any breakers. Mm. But So, I mean, we start with C2, but do we need to see anything else to go up to C1 here? Do we need to see... Heating, do we need to see? Well, I think it's exposure? on the verge of C1 because you've got exposed or damaged insulation there. Mm. It's I mean, most likely that's going to happen within the system as well. Some of that. Oh, do you know there. what? Apologies. Um, I'm, I was looking at that neutral and I thought it went into strands. He's right. One of the chaps yeah. online has said it's a CPC. Yeah. Apologies, Ian. I need new glasses. Um, and there's me trying to make these photos as big as possible. Yeah, you're right. That's a CPC there. Yeah, the line has already got exposed copper on it or just to the. Uh, yes top above there so that insulation is degrading and disintegrating yeah, if you, already if you, if you follow yeah the 32 amp vi if you follow it up goes left just when it goes behind the red after that there's a bit of exposed there so yeah, there is damage great. to that yeah what did, so, the, what did the panel say well the panel's gone to c2 and some have gone on to c1 okay so 
Majority C2, okay, some C1. Again, it's in the eye of the, eye of the inspector, the identifier of the risk. Yeah, and also obviously there's lots of other stuff which you can't see in this picture, so... What did, is, this, is this one of yours, John? So what did you do this? Did you do a C2 here, C1? I think this was a C2 because I think from memory it only supplied a single socket, which... Uh, so there wasn't any risk of actually overloading it. But, so you're thinking uh, you're both, you know, you're now thinking about other stresses that this will yeah. then have to take. That makes sense. Okay, yep. All right. Next one. Right, this one is a bit of a mess. And the main thing here is the incoming supply on the top right there and how the earth connection has been implemented with that uh, interesting assembly of bits. Very of creative. Mm. <laughs> So steeple. So steeple are a, uh, a sub-brand of Electrium, also known mm. as Crabtree and Wilex. Yep. Um, doesn't mean necessarily you can um, install their breakers without telling them. Is that a Legrand breaker in there? That that one on the left. That's one of those. I think they were control gear direct at some point. Mm. They're being bought out by Legrand. They, I'm pretty, pretty yeah, sure that that the, symbol was for Legrand. Legrand went into board manufacturing for a while. The reason that's there is probably because steeple is a brand that Denman's wholesalers sell mm, right. uh, or they used to sell and then mm. they change manufacturer and that that B32 at the end looking underneath it sell now. so in theory see, it's all yeah. Denman's but but looking underneath it you can see buzz bar there's clearly not enough clearance there yeah that yeah. breaker does not like that board no it doesn't it's been bodged in swarf in the board naughty boys um, the, the line conductors just look like a bit of a twisted mess um what else have we got oh god i hate you look at the fixing screw i hate countersunk screws on boards without penny washers i'm i'm a big fan of a penny washer with a pan head screw um so that you apply the correct um Man, uh, like heard you on shout the fixing. people for that so yeah. i have yeah i have shouted at people haven't i yeah i've gone eight oh that's right yeah you did hear me have a go at someone for that didn't you pan heads pan heads and yeah pan heads is that yeah. a pyro coming into it yes it is Mm. Okay. Oh, so this is a ret this is a retrofit on a okay. So, probably so what do we think about this earthing conductor connection? I mean, it's not got the BS nine five one. Hang on a minute, that is a Tembi clamp that someone's butchered and yeah, yeah, put exactly. around the pot. Yeah, so there's no safety lift connection. Do not remove label on that. Yeah, so I guess the is not attached to the consumer unit body. But what they've just cut a massive hole out of the top. It's just floating in. Passed it through, floating, and then they've attached that clamp. They on. have, because the body of the pot is bigger, isn't it? And the and yeah. the bush. I would have probably gone to actually re gland that and actually yeah, have a dedicated in a, CPC. In a metal enclosure, shorted, shorted it. Yeah, yeah, that should have been glanded correctly into a metal enclosure with a dedicated C. So it's. But is it's this just C3 bodge. stuff, or is this C2? I'd C2 it, do you want to show you? Is the just, integrity just, of the earthing. Bon, bon, Integrity, the earthing, um, the RC, so that's a split RCD board, mm -hmm. a, AC type, which you know my views on it. I think we'll be coding them C2s and C3s pretty soon. We said that last year, didn't we? We did. We said that. And yeah, trust me, everybody, it's coming. Yeah. You'll be you'll be coding AC RCDs whether you want to or not. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I. The the pyro for me is the the biggest concern there. I think. Oh, there's a bit of copper showing on some of the conductors on the circuits. That six amp lighting circuit. That's double. Looks like they've doubled up on the lighting circuit straight away. The one in the middle. Oh, yeah. um, you have so there's these, definitely when, some when further have, investigation. When you have many of these little 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 things like this, do you guys add each individual observation, or do you just do workmanship as one to represent that those termination methods? See, all these little terminations depends. are just slightly picking <clears throat> out all these little bits of copper. It depends on the person ordering the work. To a, well, it kind of depends on the inspector and the person ordering the work. Because for me, I would, I would say like Swarf could be improved, C3. Mm. Fixing detail, I would take that countersunk screw out rather than wait for someone to lean on that board and then have that board fall down and put all strain on that gland. But then again, in the same breath, I'd then say, well, that gland should be repotted, re-terminated with a new board or the board lowered. But then again, you probably can't lower the board because of the method of installation. And it looks like this mounted directly to plaster. So there's a level of stripping and rework that needs to be done there that takes your improvement required into, if you don't do this, what is the actual risk? I mean, I'm looking at two six amp breakers with five circuits potentially in it. Um, I'm looking at AC split load board, which the connected use of the installation. Are we using intelligent stuff? Have we got inverter drive washing machines? 
you know, the, the stuff that requires the A-type, is that a considerable factor? Mm -hmm. um, uh, realistically, it's, 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 it's screaming, shouting C3, um, but I would just because of the pyro and the method of connection for earthing, because most codes around earthing are a C2, um, I would suggest that, I mean, it looks like there's a fan on the right-hand side of that um, board. If it's yeah. there and it's going to get knocked, it's going to suffer from vibration, that terminal could come loose. So for me, it's a C2 based on the earthing and termination of the gland. Um, cool. That's yep. just, just a view of it. Mm. Um, and also, yes, sizes of the pyro, although pyro can carry far more than uh, yeah. others, which is why a lot of the old buildings have got the submains wired in it. Um, yeah, there's a lot of little bits in this one, but the uh, the incoming was the main thing. This is John Ward's board again, isn't it? Uh, yeah, this is the, uh, the same one with the gas pipe in front of it we saw before. Hey, you've and, got it off. Uh, now we can see what's inside. And uh, pay attention to what types of devices are actually installed inside this, what was a twin RCV consumer unit. So we've, we, okay, we've, we've got a main switch replaced um, for an RCD? Yeah. Right? What the, it was a twin a RCD, minute. a BG one, and then the left RCD has been <coughs> and someone's put a switch in there instead of the wrong So main. a Luden main switch, Yeah. Um, which is a modern one because it's got a torque setting on it, so it's pretty recent. Was that, do you think, to stop a nuisance tripping fault? Yeah, almost. Yeah, certainly. definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, probably, probably stopped it tripping. I really don't like those types of lugs. They just look, they, it just makes, yeah. yeah, it worries me when I see them boards with all that metal on show and it looks like it's putting it's, strain. That neutral in the top right yeah. corner looks like it's putting massive strain on the neutral bar. We've seen a lot of neutral fires and it's often that lugging that's one of the culprits. Mm. Um, okay, so I'm assuming here then we're going to have circuits that need an RCD but now don't have one. That's right. Okay. So Different manufacturer right. assembly. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get this poll going. Can't then. see what time. Um, and a nice again, without screw at the top left when they wash. Not understanding the rest of the installation, I can see a yeah. cable going up into another assembly, a board. It's been mounted on ply. Um, you can see down the bottom, there's the old meter board and the tails coming up through the back. Um, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> my my heart is telling me C three, but again with the RCD and the RCD must the push the use of the installation. If the RCD yeah, needed. yeah. The other totally. thing here is that the RCD on the right is an eighty amp, I believe. And if you look at the actual circuit rate it's supplying, you've got three thirty two, is a forty and a sixteen. Mm. So keep it warm. Now, if the yeah. main fuse is an 80 amp, then that's it's three rings. Okay, but if the main fuse is 100 amp, that's not well balanced, is it? It's not protected against overload. So, well, it's like oh. I mean, we've got 132 on this other RCD that's not an RCD anymore, but that's obviously is that a cooker? No, is that a shower circuit? It was either a cooker, I think it was the cooker, it was a cooker and a shower in this one. Yeah, so there's no, no garrow unit then. <laughs> yeah. Um, just on another note, John, uh, the comments rightfully highlighted. No, where's the bonding on that? Yeah. Well, they, the bonding may go down to the main earth terminal by the meter, in all fairness. A lot yeah. of them do do that. They just have a CPC coming out the board. Um, I'm not a fan of putting bonding into a domestic board. I would always rather have it on an earth terminal that's easy to disconnect with a tool rather than going into a live board. So for me, um, I don't put bonding in boards. It's always separate. But yeah, it's again, it's depending on choice and yeah, accessibility but, and all um, the rest of it. But we, yeah, but as as we look into things in the future, we may start looking at those terminals when outside. We may have to think about enclosing them. Yo, yes, we will potentially in future. Um, yeah. In future yes. Yeah. Um, what was the, what was the judgment on it all then? All right, we have got C2s. Yeah, C2s, yeah. yeah, some good judgments in there as well. Mm. It's good. It's good. I, I like working your way up. Through it and having the argument of yourself, the clients what, I think yeah, you're schizophrenic. I always do. I always do. You've always got to. You've got to start somewhere, but then you've got to kind of reassess. Sit in your van, chat to your mate, ask him if you're going mad, and then after a few years, well, again, you go, you're not mad. You know, if you're on your own, I mean, Codebreaker's a good second voice. It's not your decision maker, Indeed. but it's an opinion. Right, let's ramp this up a bit. Yep. Right, this um, this was under a floor, joining a load of cables together, just One. loose. Flapping about, that's actually after it's taken out, but uh, take up the floorboard, that's what you find underneath. 
Okay, so it's not readily accessible. No. But it's crap. Yes. Right. It also well, and there's signs, signs of... Things. Well, the earthing arrangement is horrific. Yeah. Um, there's signs of that chemical breakdown on the insulation because all that green goo. The mm -hmm. neutral looks like it's burnt out. It does look like it's not quite home in there, doesn't it? It looks like it's just... It's yeah. just given up the ghost. That's definitely not on an RCD. I don't know if you did. You actually test this, John, to see no, if there was, was just, or was it just it a rewire? Rip it was all just being ripped out. For regardless, oh, thank God. Because <laughs> yeah. technically, you know, it might still be electrically sound for our testing. Just why it's so important to inspect then test. I, isn't it? I, again, I go with electrical connections. One on that. That's just not suitable, sufficient. I'd also go with um, uh, good workmanship materials. One three four one one. Mm -hmm. It's just not good workmanship, nor the correct use of materials. So to me, that's a C2. I wouldn't want to improve that. I'd want to rip it out and say, that's potentially dangerous. You need to rip that out. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. Um, um, what does everyone say? We've got... We've got the quotes. Fire waiting to happen. Yep. There we go. So John yeah. Jono saying something the Caffili clown would do. Evidently a Welsh joke there. <laughs> yeah, C2s, C1s. Yeah, valuing all of it, valuing all of it. To be honest with you, I we could all we could spend hours debating all these, and I think we'd all agree actually, depending on different points of view, and come to more of a collect. But this is just a teaser type thing um, that just to get the the, the pencil sharpened, really. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to go with a C2, but I don't disagree with the C1s out there as well. Um, next one, holy cow! Yeah, this uh, this was a two bedroom flat consuming it. What exactly it was doing with all these circuits wasn't uh, entirely clear. How many clear, different but... breakers are in there? Steeple, yeah. GE, ProTech. Oh, this God. looks like whatever's cheapest when the work's needed. Yeah. Can I can I have a quick vent while everyone's coding this? I can't stand these top, these really tall RCBOs. They they were they're designed as retrofits, but they do not fit in bloody any boards made oh. twenty years ago at all. And some positions of boards, you just cannot get the neutrals in properly. No confidently they just put them way beyond reach uh, that's a perfect example of a board that just isn't an, a manufactured assembly it's just Simple. not been considered as a holistic assembly at all no nah. nah, nah, nah. too much copper showing uh, uh, on top of the um terminals again workmanship the white fly leads i'd be cutting them back i'd be crimping them um and uh, putting them in their relevant terminals um strain look at the strain on the main tails on the left bending radius of those conductors Bending radius of the conductors on the um, tall RCBOs. Access and maintenance of uh, the neutral bar is difficult. It's just a really poor workmanship. Okay, so we've got lots standard. of it could be improved. Oh, sorry. We've got lots of it could be improved, but is anything in here the smoking gun for potentially dangerous? C2. Uh, yeah. I'm going to go with... I would work it to a C2 with the strain on the conductors, but I'd want to Those FI tails, this. Yeah. Those tails need, they look like there's a lot of strain in there. I'm not comfortable not huge. with those. No, I'm not at all. At least the RCBOs are type A. Well done, Steeple. Um, they've been out for years, by the way. People research them. Our type A RCBOs have been out for like 20 years. Hmm. Um, MK did them. My old house had RCBOs. So I didn't even realize at the time what they were. So John, was this one of yours? It was one I had the misfortune of going looking at, yes. This well, I was bet a, you were singing it in the day. Something that somebody was looking to purchase, the bill or the flat. And I just went, literally went there just for a quick look to get a general idea of the state it was in, and this was uh, one of the things which was found. Mm, yeah. so. so, I mean, in this situation, what would you recommend? Would you recommend um, a, a new board to just more economically consolidate this mess? to one manufacturer or did um, yeah you... it's a minimum and this one was in a, an appalling place as well it was actually under the stairs or equivalent of under the stairs literally on the floor mm. in sort of the literal triangle a bit so it was really hard to get to as well and there was a whole pile of other problems in this this building with it it was it looked like it had been done fairly well to start with and then over the years someone's added a bit and someone else yeah. added something else and this is the end result so yeah, all alterations and additions, isn't it? In the end of the day, without taking into account yeah. ability, the overall impact on the installation. Yeah, looks like we've got a firm C2, C2. here. Yeah, I'm, I'm with that. Definitely yeah, C2s. Definitely, definitely agree with some C3s in there. Definitely agree with some FI as well. So it's good. Right, moving on. If I can. Oh, dear Lord. Right. This is, now, this is uh, a common one. Yeah. 
twin and earth outside and this is supplying some outbuilding of some sort and it's just hanging there in the air and was its condition good as you found it was, was it a bit brittle to touch too, maybe uh, it was a bit green and grotty so green and grotty. the trouble is is the regs do allow twin and earth and that's the problem this is one of the big debates that's happened repeatedly on social media with regards to twin and earth being clear. I've found installations where I've gone out to someone's shed and there is twin and earth and you can, when you look at it in the sun, all you can see is splits and copper shining through. Hmm. But the person has just been blissfully unaware. Uh, and yet the wiring rigs allows it. And I would absolutely ban twin and earth being clipped outside a building without suitable UV and mechanical protection on it. Yeah, there's a couple of things. There's UV, obviously. Then we've got to think about things like the travel that conductors take under temperature. So mm -hmm. if these conductors are going out and they're under little to no negligible demand, then you're not going to see much unless they're constantly being under UV light. But if you're going to then go to a shed that's got a, you know, a wash machine or a tumble and you're going to constantly turn that on, then that changing of temperature could break down the insulation as well. Yeah, this is one of the few things I completely disagree with the regs uh, and, and also the IET forums where they've said, well, it is technically acceptable. Stop saying that rubbish. We have enough information as an mm. industry to see that this cable breaks down and is a potential hazard. Um, just don't allow it. Make sure any uh, sheathed cable is mechanically protected and protected against UV degradation. That's good yeah. selection direction. Why the regs even mention allowing this is mind blowing. It's, it's, just a, it's, just a, it's just being anal with the fact that it might statistically fall within certain tolerances. Well, it becomes, it, yeah. the trouble is, is the regs is a, a, almost a set of instructions to guide the selector and erector, mm. um, and as, as well with the inspector. But I would just say common sense, no mechanical protection, um, no support on terminations, no protection against UV or mould degradation um, will eventually cause a hazard and accident to homeowner. So I'd see to it. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, what have we got? We have got C2. Great. Marvellous. We're going to move on. Two-thirds of C2. Well, I'm going to speed these up a wee bit. Okay. I don't know why that photo's overlaid. That's a standard one, wooden back box. I think that's one of yours, John. Yeah, it's a wooden, uh, wooden back box. The wiring is newer than the back box, so someone's put new wires in or new cables in because there is a CPC there. And uh, But, of course, this uh, wooden box is the issue and also you got your fixing screws straight into those little bits of timber on either side so not a particularly reliable fixing it's a light switch uh, people haven't obviously worked it out yet yeah so i mean, I mean it, do we now say this is a risk of fire combustibility well, enclosures or legacy yeah i mean it doesn't comply now because it's a flammable enclosure yeah. but in the 1960s or earlier this is what they were made of yeah. so I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to argue to toss it. To me, that's a C3 um, because that looks like it's embedded in a, a wall, which is non-combustible in itself. Yes, mm -hmm. the material is combustible, but unless there is um, a a risk of, of the uh, available fire loading causing a mass detriment mm -hmm. to the house, I would suggest it uh, requires improvement for a metal back box that can utilise the earthing, and, and yeah, yeah, and receive the switch better. I'll be fairly confident with that. Uh, yeah. There does appear to be a bit of copper peeking between that. Through, is that or is that light shining through that tape? That reflection of light. Probably a bit of reflection. Bit of yeah, yeah reflection. Reflection of light. Right. Yeah. What have we got on the on this? We've got mainly C three, a couple of C twos. Yeah, yeah, I think that's reasonable. There's nothing immediately dangerous here, and it's not really anything that's going to become dangerous. But is it in a? It's in. It's in a uh, brick and plaster wall, isn't it? So yeah, yeah. It's not going to spread a fire. Yeah. No, the only the only thing you need to be well. careful of is that hole where the cable comes down. Mm. Um, but relatively, the volume of material that could burn um, is very unlikely to produce a level of heat where you could actually get a transference which could heat another combustible surface to the point where it would catch fire, i.e. a joist above it. So yeah. I, I wouldn't put that as a C2, although Mr. Watts will tell me otherwise. Um, <laughs> right, moving on. Jesus. We're nearly there, by the way. Um, right, another... Wirex consumer unit, fuse box, whatever. Someone's upgraded one of them, if you want to call it that, with that lovely uh, six amp thing at the end. And then, of course, the main problem here is uh, all of those cables spewing out the top. Is this um, a, is this a, is, was all this boxed in and the boxing's been taken away? No, that's actually how it was. That's actually how it was. It's in a cupboard. So you open the cupboard door, this wow. is what you find. Well, at least you've got slack to remake the board off. Yeah. 
I mean, one of those cables isn't even in the board on the right hand side there. It's just, oh, yeah. just hanging down. So. It's hanging down. I know you'd be looking at prescribed zones and stuff for cables coming down, but for me, that is desperate for some trunking. Um, is that the, the whole board for the whole installation? Yes. Oh, uh, yeah, okay. There's, there's way too much attached to it. Hang on, how many circuits are in it? A lot. Oh, <laughs> well, there's only four circuits. Twelve. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Right, that, yeah, magic. okay. That's the C2 there, isn't there, really? Yeah, the division of installation, all sorts. Um, yeah, we've got C2 wow. here. JW, you have come across some crap, says Dean Cafferty. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, That's because uh, he works majorly in the domestic, which we do often say the domestic is a very um, exciting area to work in. Indeed, indeed. Um, right, okay. So yep. the results in, yeah? C2? Yeah, yeah. yeah C2. What have we got? All right, right, so we have a downlight here. A connection. Yep. We kind of, this, Another is kind common of one. this might be coming from the joint box we had earlier on. Yeah, I think we said it was a C2 there, wasn't it, really? Same principle, yeah. same issue. If we can agree that, I'll skip on this one. I think we'll skip on. This will come up as a C2. Yep. Now there's, there. a, oh, okay. ooh, there's a nice one. Broken switch. C1. Yep. Uh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it just so that we can just check. Yeah, it's all C1s. C1s. 20, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, yeah. Fantastic. We're on agreement. C1. Direct good access stuff. to live parts. And again, a, a good inspector. Hopefully, if he's got on his band some spare light switches to make the problem go away yeah, Build it into pricing. Yeah. but again that's a good thing though you just said that a good inspector hopefully should again good inspectors should have some basic mate resources. i'm not on the tools full time and yet i've got enough gear in my house in my shed to rewire two houses mm. don't know why I'll if, you know if you were to something. audit an inspector who claims to be a good inspector you probably go well let's look at what's in your wagon yeah to see what you can what do accessories have you got know. To sure. prevent rise of danger. Right, moving on. We're nearly there. Hooray. Um, now, John, Jesus. This is one of your ones, wasn't it? No, this isn't one of mine. No, I don't remember this one. Hang on. This is another one sent on Instagram. Mm -hmm. This is a, um, a board that's just been butchered and battered over the years with cables. As you can see, the picture on the left, someone's running twin nerf rather than down the conduit, just chopped a hole in the top. You can see they've uh, put a Garrow RCD cool. with Hager stuff. We've got at least three cables in it. You look at the size of the main tails. Um, it's just, to me, immediately screams out, there's no good workmanship materials. This was tested, inspected, and sent to me. Um, it was just really bad workmanship materials all round, really. Mixture mm. of manufacturers. Uh, had been. It was a DIY job for anybody asks. Um, and just seems to be seeing a lot of multiple circuits into breakers these days. Well, yeah, I mean. it saves the end user fortune, isn't it, really? Mm. Um, they don't get subdivision of installation. <clears throat> so I, I uh, straight away looking at that obviously it had a board cover on by the way so all you saw was a cable tie wrap to the top but that to me was a a c3 at first look um mm -hmm. but the mixing and matching the doubling up on the breakers the 25 amp on them cables i think they're 2.5s c25s mm, maybe yeah, push that yeah. towards c2 looks like the majority of guys have we've got yeah, here so. yeah 75% C2. Great. Um, this is the last one. This is um, this is to tease the DNO one we're going to do. So this is a wonderful old DNO uh, head. It's one of the old um, Pilk paper insulated red lead wrapped conductors. You can see from it there's a um, uh, an earthing conductor coming out the bottom. There's actually two of them. One went down to a clamp on the lead sheath. The other one uh, came out of uh, the side of it. And that's what you've got. But if you look carefully at the circle, you can see an exposed conductor where somebody has obviously changed that neutral connection over the years. This is normally filled with pitch yeah. as an insulating compound or an alleged insulating compound. <laughs> yeah. May I say that? <laughs> I think I will. Yeah. Hopefully we can show the video by then. Um, yeah. But yes, so um, this is, um, this is, what would you code that? Now, obviously outside of the scope of 7671 is the DNO equipment, although code breakers does have codes for it because it's fundamental for protection of the overall electrical installation. There is a debate we're going to have on this yeah. during the intake one as to um, whether or not this actually is within the scope of 761. And it's one of the debates I'm currently having with the IET. Um, because I genuinely believe that the DNO intakes are fundamentally inside the scope of 761, but I'm going to leave it there to tease. You have to watch the DNO intakes webinar 
as yeah. to understand why. Yeah. But, uh, but um, what would you code that? Well, I mean, the 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 regulations in in my head immediately go, oh, you know, there's there's no safety electrical connection. Do not remove label on the external MET. Mm -hmm. So there's a C three there. Uh, but then I look at the rest. And then I start to question how much I need to know about DNO intakes if I'm going to start taking accountability and responsibility for my observations, which goes on to our DNO presentation that we're going to do in a few weeks. Yeah, yeah. Because we've got Jeez. a lot of questions to ask <laughs> on that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Please please tune into that one. That's going to be a yeah. mind blower. Um, so I'm going to go see one just because that's under a staircase, small child scenario. Mm -hmm. It may not meet the IP finger test. What's but, the risk? Um, For those who may not know, what is the risk here? It's the life part within the circle where the neutral connection mm -hmm. is. Okay, um, so also reaching the off the live parts. Yes. Okay. So for me, it's it's. Uh, I, I'm going at C1. I can see a lot of people say it's a C2 because it's a. Uh, again, it depends on your assessment of risk of accessibility. Uh, could you maybe put some sort of shielding around that? Is that a matter of opening up them screws? undoing the neutral terminal and lowering it down, which we're not authorized to do, no. which is one of the nuisance things, um, which again, I think DNO training should be in electrician's training. I do. I think a training on that equipment should be part and parcel of, of our mm. ongoing CPD. Mm. I think it's definitely exposure to a live conductor. You can't ignore yeah. that. And if you no. say it as simply as that, then you're going to have to go, well, that must be a C2. At least. So what is the, at least what is maybe the, a C1. What does the survey said? We're, we're hovering around C1s and C2s. Paul, you yeah. must know a lot of small children looking for electrical equipment. No, but I have read lots of reports of people dying and fires occurring. So, yeah. And hopefully we'll be able to show them to you very soon um, because there is a lot of information in our industry that our industry does not tell us. Is that There's fair to say, Dave? Know. There's a lot that we don't know. There's a lot of stuff that's been going on for years. We well, are slowly discovering finding. and we're basically kind of, yeah, we're learning more every day. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. seriously not a lie as well. It's <laughs> no. just not right. No. Okay, so we'll see one. That are we? Are, have we run the poll? Is everybody saying it's a C one? Yeah, we got majority of C one. Sixty uh, fifty nine percent C one. Uh, Thirty percent C two on that one. Again, I wouldn't disagree with a C one or a C two. To be honest with you, yeah, definitely. It's potent. There's potential danger there, and something needs to be done. Um, for me, uh, you know, I wouldn't argue with a C two and a phone call to the DNO as I would a C one and a phone call to the dno now this is this is the very last one because it's just to kind of get people thinking a bit we've done lots of inspections this was sent to me by the chap who took it and this was um 247 volts between the kitchen sink yeah and a bosch tumble dryer it's again this, it's more of a safety message it's at this it's, it's scenarios like this where we start to see voltages we don't expect to see them or we have people experiencing sensations on washing machines yeah where we really need to understand our lack of understanding on earthing and bonding separately to earthing. Yeah. Um, and if you have these scenarios and you can't properly fault find or, you know, diagnose these problems, then you need to, you need to kind of speak up and let us know so that we can look at getting some understanding on earthing and bonding improved. So what do we see here? We've got one probe on a tap, which is providing a zero volt reference of that. Correct. Uh, yes. Yes. Via it's a basically a fortuitous path. Yeah. via the uh, copper pipes that feed the kitchen. Yeah. Um, and it turned out that the investigation was the builder who did the kitchen had chopped through a conduit. The old conduit in the um, building was the CPC because a lot of old buried conduits did act as CPCs. Um, he had obviously done a repair and reinstated it, but hadn't reattached uh, the earth. So there was obviously a fault uh, in the in the machine somewhere and when he put his uh, direct contact probe across the two he was able to get a 247 volts now right. interestingly uh, again another tease really is there is now more noise in the dnos about using um uh voltage contact testers um on fixed equipment even on dno heads now because of tracking mm. across the heads but we'll cover that in another yeah. webinar so mm. Just be mindful. It's literally a safety message. Be mindful, careful what you're touching and, and listen to the, the user of the installation and the concerns that they have. I think that's fair to say. It might even be worthwhile asking the only thing you get any tingles off any equipment performing as it shouldn't be. Yeah. And going I around do and remember doing checks. getting tingles. If you get someone saying I'm getting tingles. Okay. Sometimes that's because they're not touching a very good zero volt reference, but they're actually touching mains voltage. 
Yeah. I did. Um, I work. I work for. I work with a building insurance company, and I was asked to go to Bagshot and investigate a shower fault. And the guy doing it was a, a flood. Uh, it was a water tank fell through the ceiling, and they were just doing all the final work on restoring the bathroom. But they changed a, me- a plastic handrail in the shower to metal. And what had happened is years before they moved the switch in the wall to the left by two or three inches, and they actually put a connect block in the wall, and they crushed the cable connector block when they filled the plaster work in. This was years prior. Mm-hmm. It was only when the restoration work was done that they changed this handrail from plastic to metal. So they basically created an, uh, an electrode in the wall. Okay. And now they were getting a shock. Oh but beforehand, the voltage there was negligible, but now there was a zero volt reference, the voltage was huge. So if you see people getting little shocks, little touches, don't touch an earth and then try it, for crying out loud. Because awesome. that's, that's a bad idea. Right. Okay. So this is just a final slide to remind you what the codes are. Um, we'll, we'll again, we'll stick this on YouTube. Um, yep. Lastly, I want to go back to the beginning very quickly. Right. Before, be- the... before you close, if you've yes. got, there's a couple of questions in the Q and A. If any of you guys have a question uh, that hasn't been answered in chat, then throw it in there and we'll try and get through five or six we'll, before we, we'll, talk, before we we'll fly through this. So this is yeah. the four stages of competence. I love it. It's a great visual diagram. Um, four stages of competence. There's unconscious incompetence. Now I suffer from this. every one of these mm. unconscious incompetence. You don't know that you don't know how to do something. Well, mm. that's me when I go and talk to someone in the industry from a different sector, I am unconsciously incompetent. Then I become consciously incompetent okay and that's where you know that you don't know how to do something and it bothers you that's the journey that a lot of learners and trainees are currently on they're consciously incompetent then you emerge from that and you go into a conscious competence you know you know how to do something and it takes great effort writing this webinar i finished 10 minutes before we started it um and that's true it took, took me days to write these um probably about five six days in total um unconscious competence is where you know how to do something and it's second nature you rocket it guys who are doing eicrs every single day get better and better by the week because they use reference material like code breakers like the wiring regulations like the um, electrical safety first um, guidance notes to practice developing their knowledge from a document and questioning things so that's a good little slide there. Uh, just to add to that, they do it, they repeat, they repeat, they repeat, but then they can uh, they can actually then become unconsciously incompetent yeah. because they may come across new technology. Yes, absolutely. In the workplace that wasn't there before, but they didn't know. I, I genuinely it, believe. Cycle. I genuinely believe at one point in my life, I was unconsciously competent at EICRs when I was doing it regularly. And the more further I went away from doing them, I became consciously competent because it takes effort. But now when stuff like type A RCDs and arc fault detection, I started off as unconsciously incompetent, went straight to consciously incompetent because it bothered me. And and that's fine. There is no wrong uh, part to be in. It's Mm. trying to push yourself into the unconsciously competent just you're really good at doing stuff i think it's just a great and this uh, is this, mirror this, you can hold this, up to yourself this is a cycle that works in all areas it works in regulations it's something that we kind of do we're always assessing what we don't know and then we look for things to find a you know find more information this is why paul's mentioned you know earthing and dno systems you know we found some things out and then we looked to develop to conscious competence but then we found more <laughs> well, i can't even begin to tell you <laughs> yeah there is so, at least three or four major industry bombshells that we are currently investigating at the moment. And we are literally learning this stuff from scratch. Um, but the good thing is, is we are taking our time to learn this from scratch. Um, but yeah. Mm, so awesome um, other than that, we're going to do commercial next time. We may throw some pictures in that even just there's no codes. Cause I think that'd be quite good to see yeah. some stuff with no codes in it. Um, if you can let us know via feedback, whether on the next one, we repeat the bit, bit of the start because depending on who the audience is or you want us to go straight into the coding, that'd be really cool. Um, We have Mm. coming up next Wednesday, commercial, the Wednesday after that industrial, we're then going to go and do, um, I think we're doing one on surge protection devices. We're going to do one on fire alarms, which Dan is going to do. And that's going to be very controversial. And we're going to come up with a new coding system for fire alarms working from the standard, not to the standard. Mm. Um, And we're also going to do DNO intakes where we're hopefully going to be able to talk to you about diverted neutral currents and show you some stuff that will blow your mind and yeah all right so i'm gonna jump into the questions so that we can make go sure we've had a go at each question um side off you remember you know back at seven o'clock or 707 
Uh, Steve says, socket face plate, CPC is connected to a metal back box only, but will be earthed if you put the face plate back, you know, with the screw. So if your method of earthing the socket face plate is via the screw and the connection is to the box only, so you haven't put an earth into the accessory, is that codable in your view? Yeah, I'm saying C2 for that because uh, you're literally relying on the screw for the uh, connection to the socket. Which is very much subject to rust and corrosion. I, I and was, dust. I was immediately, the, first, the minute you start that sentence, I thought C3, but then C3. Mm. Um, but then when you then consider external influences, vibration, loosening, DIY. There's a reason, um, there's a reason that connection is supposed to be in the so. accessory where it's yes. mechanically designed. Isn't it? Indeed. Yeah, you can take it from so, there back to the back box, but not the other way around. I think. I'll agree with JW actually. I'll see to that. Mm. Uh, another one fun. from Steve. If you see a C2 on the DNO side, can you still call the EICR satisfactory? So if it's you like outside. NIC told me you can't make a note of it and you can't code DNO side. Well, then tell the NIC to put it in writing and be prepared to stand next to you in the dock when the judge is questioning you because ignorance is in the defence and and that jar that boils my oh that's so <laughs> annoying that boils is, your, yeah yeah i'm sorry yeah. but that's just no <laughs> if it's a c2 it's a failure period Dane, issue a danger notification ring the dno discharge your duty of care tell them that someone's going to get hurt put it in writing uh, the nic guy on the end of a phone i'm sorry he's not there he's not the inspector he doesn't have the duty of care under all the various legislation on uh, on him yeah you do yeah so no all right. Sorry, uh, I'll last have a word from... with John O'Neill when I next hear about that. <laughs> All right. The last one from Steve at the beginning. Isn't FI meaning you've reported the fault? FI is for investigating the cause. Um, I quite understand what he's saying. Isn't FI meaning you reported the fault? FI is for investigating the cause. So further investigation is... I don't quite I'm, I'm, that I'm sorry. I'm struggling see, to understand. The you see that there. question? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, maybe uh, maybe he's what he's saying is, okay, doesn't FI mean a fault has been found and the FI is to investigate well, the cause of the fault? Well, furf, uh, further investigation means further investigation required without delay. Yeah, because further investigation could actually be that you're So it's a, bit, it's a bit of both. It's a bit of both. Yeah. It's you reporting that you need to carry out more invest. This is why I call it the time the time code. This is one where I need, this more is you time. saying to the customer, I need more time. By the way, as I'm investigating, I'm finding things that are wrong. You Again, wouldn't it, say further investigation to investigate how yeah. beautiful and lovely it is. It could be, for example, let's say you've done sampling and you said, oh, I'm going to sample one of those 12 luminaires, but the one I've sampled is absolute dog shit. But I've not got it in the arranged contract or the dismantling. I've not got authorization from the client to dismantle the others, to lower the others. But I might not be satisfied. Might not be satisfied that that one luminaire was enough, and I might want to look at more. So I've not found a fault, but I want to look at more of the installation to see if there is more of that. Dave, so if I can be used for that. David Betteridge has said, um, "Please let me answer this one." Go the on. never-ending debate between code breaker versus best practice guide with walls less than fifty mil. C two code breakers, C three best practice guide. My opinion. C two your opinions. Um, I've noticed a few in here that may have had their hand in the code breaker. Yes, funny enough. We did write certain parts of it. Um, I'm going to, I'm just going to yeah. be very clear here and say it's, um, it's a C3. It's not a C2. And the reason why it doesn't line up with electrical, am I allowed to say it? I'll say it anyway. Um, the reason why it doesn't line up with the electrical safety um, uh, first best practice guide is because individuals within the organization of NAPIT wanted a different code. I don't necessarily agree with that. So again, I'm not using code breaker as my minimum benchmark. I'm working from it. And if I disagree with it, I'm fine because my perception of risk, my ability to um, tell a judge why, if it's in prescribed zones, et cetera. Remember yep. 20 years ago, we weren't mandating RCDs. So we had EBADOS, we had the necessary selection and erection and mechanical protection and mm. lots of other things we need to be able to justify. So yeah. there you go. There's the real reason behind that. <laughs> okay he's got another one maybe not a coding issue but a testing one on the calculation of zs using ze impedance and r1 r2 the no parallel paths taken into the measurement higher fault current possibility i personally still think a full zs impedance test but electricity wet regs doesn't like this method so that you know the the we shouldn't do live zs testing because electricity wet regs doesn't want us to do live work if we don't need to do live work and a lot of people are what calculating it the whole argument of ZS testing and parallels and measurement and non-compliance with electricity work regulations and stuff. 
I've I've voiced my opinion to say that you should test as much as you can test and let's see where regulations. Live, I'm I'm sorry, but yeah, I, I was going to say live working. Um, yes, live working should be reduced so far as is reasonably practicable. And my, my statement to every electrician I've ever worked with is the only times when live working is acceptable is when you are proving, uh, when you're doing proving live for safe isolation and undertaking live testing to prove this connection and the fault path of a breaker. There is, you have suitable control measures in your competence, your knowledge, your tools, your equipment, your checks, your safe working method. I am meeting more and more people that are just saying calculate um, I was raised, and forgive me for saying this out loud, but I was raised of the school that you would be shot if you calculated stuff. But the industry seems to be pushing more and more easy ways to get people out the door quicker. Um, and uh, yeah, if I can't do it, I would rather limit and put it in my extent and limitations rather than calculate it, to be perfectly frank. Mm -hmm. the calculation, calculation should validate your testing. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. the problem with calculating it is that you're adding two different things together impedance yeah. and resistance, and resistance. Yeah, are true. not the same they're not the same no they are not the same indeed um that's exactly how mr skirm answers that scenario don't as get well. me started on this um so yeah we, we 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 challenged the whole calculation as not a good a good thing um daniel would like clarification on the 433.3.12 which is the emission of overload protected devices for the characteristics of the load if it's not likely to carry an overload current Resistive loads are given here, so resistive loads are considered not to need overload protection. But what if the equipment has capacitive components, inductive components, electronic components? Does oh, that mean it that now one. can does that mean it now could overload? Well, it might. It depends on the device. If you've got, say, a cooker, traditionally mm. a cooker can't overload because it's all resistive elements. But if it's a fan oven, it's got a motor in it and motors can overload depending on what type of thing they are and uh, electronic stuff it depends how it's going to fail bits of it might fail short circuit not a problem it's not impossible for electronic stuff to overload things so yeah it's it's really considering what type of load you've actually got including all the components that might be within it so uh, say like an oven with a fan in it's uh, not necessarily yeah. your fixed resistive load anymore no, I mean, many loads could obviously have impedances, but as you say, if it's got a motor that can overwork and overload or sockets that you can plug in too much and overload, then fine. So, yeah, I think resist maybe resistive loading is probably the wrong term to use now. Mm. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say. It's, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think you know, most it, stuff has electronics and other kind of stuff in it now. The, the doesn't mean it'll overload, does it? Yeah, the, the pure resistive heater isn't something you're going to come across much these days. <laughs> no. Uh, okay, Renee. If this installations, uh, if this installation no have RST protection, what do we do with supplementary bonding? Okay, let's rephrase this. So, there's an installation that has no RCD protection. Do we go on to look at supplementary bonding, or do we recommend supplementary bonding, or recommend RCD protection? Well, if it's a bathroom, there be bathrooms here. Yeah, if it's a bathroom and there's no RCD, then yes, it will need supplementary yeah. bonding. Mm. So, yeah, and if it has it, it'd have to have adequate supplementary bonding yeah. to. Yeah. To the requirements well we used to supplementary bond every damn thing together now now it's supplementary bonding just pretty much exists you remember in cage the, bonding locations. in bathrooms remember that yeah and the thing is that just because you've got an rcd for a bathroom doesn't automatically mean you don't need a supplementary bonding because you might no. still need it depending on what things you've got in the bathroom mm -hmm. so presence of rcd is not some green tick to not do anything else it's just part of the it's thing one of many things it's one of one of the requirements of yeah. the other parts yeah um, what's our opinion on rodent damaged cables buried in loft insulation under boarding in very full lofts, twin earth conductors exposed, found during lighting job and just couldn't leave it there in good consciousness. Yeah. If it's got well, rodents, that man, I mean, yeah, yeah so you're going to, uh, yeah. So you can't leave it there. You're going to, you're going to seek to remedy that, but obviously don't replace like for like, unless you obviously try to, you know, um, remove the, the fauna. Yeah, yeah, the this rodent is trouble in um, thatched cottages and places a lot of which there's a lot mm. in Dorset here. Um, in that sort of situation, twin earth is not an acceptable use. It's basically steel conduit because if you've got rats once, they're, they're going to be back. coming back, regardless yes. of whether the house owner says, "Oh, I don't have rats in my house." But the fact is, <laughs> they're, they're there, so 
they're going to come back. So didn't we used to wire up like um, in thatched cottages? Didn't we used to use pyro years ago? Yes, I remember it all used to be in pyro. You couldn't wire a thatched cottage unless it was in mineral insulated pyro. Is that is that not that. still a thing? You can still do it if you want to pay the money, but it, it normally ends up a steel conduit because it's cheaper. Right. Okay. Fair enough. All, all right. right. It's really cheap anyway, but it's, it's cheaper than the uh, yeah. Other options, yeah. Uh, where are we standing with properties where the main water pipe is plastic and there's no RCD protection and no supplementary bonding? Okay, so where are we standing if properties, if the main water pipe is plastic and there's no RCD protection and no supplementary? Well, there's a number of things there, really. You know, the RCD Damn thorough inspection, a damn lot of testing. Yeah. Um, a damn lot of recommendations for improvements, a lot of C3s, a lot of C2s bringing the installation back into some form of compliance. Again, as I said to you before, I think we're going to go back to EBADOS. Um, to be honest with you, well, you don't again, know whether you've got fortuitous paths on your earthing. Yeah. Um, I mean, just strengthen this, strengthen this EBADOS argument. I mean, we've already done talks on prosumer foundation earth electrodes, yep. and we're seeing with our work on DNOs that there's going to be an aggressive push for more earthing bonding. Um, so I agree. Yeah. Yeah, sorry if we're, we're saying stuff that maybe doesn't agree with the current status quo, but we're spending too much of our time researching standards that have yeah. not been integrated into 7671. So we can see where this is going, and some of it is kind of backwards a bit. Um, but it's For just a reason. technology and supplies are. Yeah. Uh, 50 watt halogen down lights that have open back with no fire hood. What code would you give? So Mark's got this one. There's no fire Ooh. hood. It's a great one, Mark. Downlots, no fire hood. So if I remember rightly, this was a this was a C3 uh, depending on where it was. So if it was in like a house, it would be a C3. But if it was in a flat where you were below another property, it would be a C2. space above. Yes. Because this is where yes. we, we, so we it's have... It's a common debate. It's a good one, yeah. though. It's about if there's a habitable space above, then that increases the level of yeah. risk. These could be a C2 above. as well, depending on what's in the void above because if you got if it's poking into a loft and that loft's full of dust and dirt and mess and stuff which could be flammable mm. you don't want to be heating up to a high temperature and setting the loft on fire so it, it could be a c2 depending indeed. on what's above it so cool indeed okay uh, um no. yeah would you code a floating wago for neutrals and a light switch so obviously we've got live conductors connected with no mechanical retention yeah uh, I think Bear my, mind, view, like, on, Hagen, my view on it, light switches with neutral terminals. Yeah, so if, if you have a light switch with a neutral in it, great, use it because it's been designed specific for that use. I've I've always been of the view that um, back boxes and light switches and dimmers were never designed to take reams and reams of neutrals, never mind ones that are called up in the back, no. um, which is why I don't use two plate wiring and I don't use, I know electronic dimmers require them. Um, but I would go with a 47 mil deep back box. Um, I would also wonder why the manufacturers of back boxes are not actually having some sort of clamp in, in the back boxes to allow the way goes to fit in. Maybe there's an innovation there that we need to ask someone it's, to design. To be, to be fair, I mean, we've, had a lot of we've had a lot of innovations in switch gear and in accessories. We've not had any innovation in our back boxes. No, and they should be. We need to mm. update them massively to, to be able to retain cables in the, in the back for this purpose. And if I saw that, that'd be great. But if anyone wants to go and design it, um, copyright E5, just give money to charity and we'll be laughing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, um, live conductors. I mean, prove. if you look at, um, is it 5377? Is that the maintenance free one? I can't remember. The maintenance free regulation requires live conductors to be free from mechanical strain. Um, and you can flip that in your inspection and say, well, if it's not you know, fixed, then it's subject to mechanical strain in the switching operation. Um, so yeah, that is technically could be improved. Does it mean it's potentially dangerous? I mean, look at the load. What loading are you talking about here? Uh, you know, so I don't know if it's potentially dangerous though. Yeah, again, connect just the, the suitability of terminations and yeah, yeah. No, it's just bending radius on the cables. Nobody ever talks about that. Bend and twist stuff together in a light switch. And That's because nobody wants that. to bend cables properly anymore. Yeah, I know. Right, come on, last, last few, and let's yeah. let everyone go. How do you think we can improve on the EICR model with extent limitations being affected more by cost than need? 
Well, um, that's true. Good that's answer. Ask a question that we can just answer in a sentence. Okay, great one. So I would print out um, the copies of the risk guide. I would print out the ethical principles guide. I would issue that to every single client and every pack that you do, um, so that they can stop moaning at you and say you receive guidance from the Engineering Council of the UK, as well as that wonderful little badge you wear on your um, on your arm or your or your T-shirt. Um, I think. The extended limitation is something the industry desperately needs work on because your clients will be incompetent. So you need to figure out how much time you've got and, and uh, very clearly map out exactly your extended limitation um, so that you are covered in if you are called back and you can at least say you've, uh, the customer has understood that. And that's something that EICRs should probably do. The, the person ordering the work should probably sign a document to say they understand the extended limitations and they've been explained to them better. So that may be something that we could um, ask them to improve on the mm. certificates. I don't know. Mm. The problem with all of that is that requires people to be motivated to do better, yes. motivated to improve. And unless bodies are going to make money from that, they're not going to put the work in to do that. So the only other way that it could be done is if you had a licensing scheme introduced with license inspectors and the company actually properly sanctioned and monitored it through a piece of software. Um, which is you know, that, that could be set up within a month. And Mr. Doyle has got a cracking one. Thank you, Sean, for that. No RCD on circuits, so however, supplementary bonding in place, flat on the third floor in a building. Would you code? Um, for me, and this is taking me back now 20 years, um, this was never an issue in flats. Uh, it was the uh, and the only argument was well, you could stick an extension lead out your window, etc. etc. For me, this was a C3, and I think if I was there. If somebody explained that to me now, I'd say it's a C3. However, again, as an inspector, I would want to go and look at the use of the installation, ask them questions on what they use the installation for. Do they have a car? Is it liable that they could have a 30 meter extension need they drop out to plug in a power washer or do you know what I mean? So again, it's understanding use, but that's my one. What's your views, guys? Well, I'll say that, yeah, just look, if you're going around their flat, Look in the cupboard and see if there's a 50 meter extension reel in there because if there is you know what it's going to be used for um in terms of would you code well there's going to be some codes because obviously no rcd at all it's going to be a load of things things like your bathrooms and the cables and the walls and all that other stuff anyway so there's going to be plenty of c3s anyway um whether you put it c2 for the socket to use outside well third floor it's certainly possible to sling the extension lead out the window of course it is um, it, it done. 20th floor probably not no but again it, it all it all depends on the circumstances but there's going to be something that's important isn't it it's so important to look at the circumstances yeah. to look at it's a great question Mark, it's yeah. a great question um right. next great question is why one of my lightsabers not working it's because the battery's dead um so there you go and they're awesome uh, uh, last one here from Stuart. The AM2 exam was accepted to leave floating neutral in the way in the back box and I can explain why that is it's because they gave you the wrong accessory um, I have been talking to NET about this whole thing. A lot of their guidance is not correct, including their isolation procedure guidance. You should not be putting neutrals in floating connections that don't have mechanical strain retention. Oh, just you know, just because they're the AM2, they're managed by NET. The assessors and the centres may be getting it wrong, and they are mm. shocking. Okay. Yes, I think that's it. Okay, uh, yeah, that's it. That is it. Uh, right, so. Thank you Thanks for well, people, um, just on have... the feedback. Yeah. We won't do the pre-start stuff on the commercial. We'll jump straight into it and we'll just ask people to watch this one. Yeah, well, we'll upload this straight away anyway. All right, guys. Well, thank you for coming in. Uh, anything else you guys want to say other than can we go? Thanks, lads. I've loved it. <laughs> um, so next week's going to be 7 o'clock yes. again, commercial. And if anyone um, watching wants to send some pictures in of any really cracking commercial stuff, um, send it in info at e5group.org.uk or just on Instagram or Twitter and I'll I'll filter it and just make sure we've got the best pictures possible to make it more engaging. So thank you for watching though. Okay. Uh, Sit. Any, any last words, John? No, I think we've covered it in extensive detail and that's sort of three hours and a bit of uh, You're time. You're joking. Is this been three hours? Yes. <gasps> um, so, yes. <laughs> And there's still people in it. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, he's hey, learning. At least we're giving you it. Yeah, this is like a live podcast. <laughs>
we can guarantee that they won't be as long next because uh yeah all right yeah and and just just also um we we do this regularly even without putting it on live webinars so this is nothing just, yeah <laughs> you've basically just had a yeah you've just had a bird uh, you know a, a behind our normal view of, our, of our new normal evenings right mm -hmm. guys um peace and love um anything else we can help you with message us otherwise we'll see you guys wednesday at seven if you want to come in for commercial thanks a lot bye bye, bye.